All right, well, all right. Welcome back to another whole class. I just got back from vacation. So I got a lot of shit to share. And I ain't scared of none of y'all. No, I'm just playing. <laughs> no, <laughs> no um, nah. Hey, welcome back. I got this is gonna be a really intense strategy class. So um couple of things is that if you're sitting down watching a class, go ahead and grab you some pencil and paper. Please take notes. Um, you know, when you when I was gone for this last week. I was down in San Diego with the family, and uh, you know, you take a vacation with kids, it's not a vacation for the adults. <laughs> just want to let you remind y'all that. Man, I ain't walked so many steps in like, I think since my 20s. Um, so, but I had a chance to do a lot of observations. Um, in the evening, I was able to hide from my daughter and do a lot of reading. Um, I was able to listen to a lot of podcasts and I'll share a story with you guys. Something that's inter real interesting. Um, I guess I'm going to start off right away. Um, it is important, extremely important to learn a lot of these principles because you can easily get hijacked by your own emotions. I had a client and they was creating nothing but friction for me. And I learned something new this weekend because I was reading this one book and I was, you know, I was, I was convinced I was in the right direction, but I didn't feel good about the direction I was in. Because in the direction I was going in, I was constantly saying, this client is doing this, this client is doing this, this client is doing this. So I found myself feeling like a victim. And for me, that's kind of an uncomfortable space to be in, because I'm not a victim, right? I, feel like I believe in optionality, which is when you're pushed into a corner, you always have an option. So I sat with one of the executive leaders on this corporate contract that we have, and we were, we were addressing one of the, the uh, top leaders and how I, had, I was frustrated with their response to one of our pres presentations. Um, I talked to the board chair. The board chair was like, hey, you know, we're excited about having you. I'm, I'm, flying, I'm driving up to Sacramento to have lunch with the board chair next week. And I kept saying, this person that we're working with, they don't like marketing, they can't, they, they, they're this, they, they, I'm just going through these deep analysis of their human behavior. And I'm looking at the defensive tones, and it's just irritating me. So I'm reading a book on my vacation, and as I'm reading the book, and he's like, yeah, it's about consultants and defense, and dealing with defensive cultures and how you address it and some of the failures that consultants have had in the past. So I'm reading, I'm reading, I'm like, yeah, yeah, yeah. And it's like, yeah, so, you know, <clears throat> you're working with this client, they're just extremely defensive, and if you say anything they don't like, they just pretty much shut the conversation down. I'm like, yeah. <laughs> and, you know, their defensive culture prevents them from hearing anything you have to say. I'm like, yeah, oh yeah, that's what it is. <clears throat> then it says, and you're part of the problem. I said, wait, what? <laughs> he said, well, a lot of times what consultants will do is they will use brilliant analysis to protect themselves. Because ultimately, instead of them being clear on what the customer wants, they will parade all this brilliance in front of you, and then if you don't receive the brilliance, which we use as a form of defense, then what would, they, what would we do is we get offended, not realizing what we actually did was because we weren't absolutely clear on what the client wanted and what problem they're trying to solve, our presentation was bypassing them. And when you bypass somebody's defensive, you trigger their defensive behavior. So in a sense, what they were doing to us, we were doing to them. So we were caught in a defensive loop. So he said, the challenge here is just find out and gain clarity on what's the win for the client. And if you don't have absolute clarity on what's the win and you don't find yourself in a position trying to impress a client, because quite often when we try to impress somebody, we don't see them, we see ourselves. Especially if you feel like you're good enough, you're doing your dance, you wrote this complex report, you're pulling up all this data, you show them how much you actually know, uh, you, you, you're, being, you're playing a defensive role. 
And in the defensive role, what you don't realize is the client is saying, I see you here, but you're not addressing my needs. And you don't even know what the fuck my strategy is, and you're not even lying with that. And so I had to sit back and go, oh, I'm making a mistake. And I had to call my business partner and say, hey, no, I wrote, I wrote a letter, I wrote a message, a text, a text one day, the executive, my executive point person, and said, can I ask you something? What is this, has the CEO defined a win for us? No. Well, why not? Well, because they're still working on a strategy. Then why are we working on branding if you, guys, if you haven't finished your strategy work? Well, because strategy work started two years ago. We thought we'd be finished by now, so we just schedule you in the process. And mind you, why they've been scheduling? They've been scheduling it's like next, next, next. What's what's next? What's next? Next phase two, phase three. Are we on time? Phase four, phase five. But the problem is that our phases and steps are in front of the strategy. But in my world, strategy comes first, then branding comes second. So what happens is the problem with this is not the person in front of me is an asshole. The problem is not I'm being an asshole. The problem is that the person who's designing the scheduling doesn't understand that by putting us up front, you're positioning us to be to bypass the CEO. And by us bypassing the CEO, you're creating natural friction. So if you want to remove the friction, slow our phases down. You gotta pay me. Slow our phases down. And make sure, and then let's lean into the, the strategy being completed. That way, whatever work we do, we're celebrating the work that the executive team has already done. But if you get us in front of the executive team, we're going to point out weaknesses. For example, okay, imagine you're moving, right? So the day that the movers dropped all the furniture off in your house, I show up and you're like, oh, you're a sloppy ass person. You're like, oh. Dog, I'm, I'm, I'm moving. I haven't got a chance to put any furniture anywhere. You're like, yeah, but I just wrote an insight report. And it says your house is trash, which means you must be trash, and everything about you is trash. You're not going to receive that conversation because I caught you in between space, right? As opposed to letting you finish lay out the designs, provide the insight report, and then that's relevant feedback based upon where you are actually are. So now, because they hired me at a stage, so by me being able to take a macro position, step back and look at the project, I realized, oh, our timing is just off. If you slow this project down, let, this, let the leadership know that we can't proceed without a clear strategy, then our job is really just to raise the value of your strategy, which then raises the value of us as a service. You guys get that? Is that some cold shit where, but I want you to see where I got to over last week and where I started, which was, all the assholes, they tripping, they full of defense, blah, blah, blah. I was weaponizing my insights as opposed to taking, which is I was in a micro space. So I'm responding to all the flashing lights and loud sounds, not realizing, just step back further. And by me realizing, oh, you're now part of the problem. Because even your reflection and your analysis is just furthering the problem. Why am I teaching you this? Whenever you hear yourself in a victim or defensive role, stop. Figure out what you're missing. See what roles you're playing in this. That's the curse of blaming. If I, let's say I'm working with silence right now and I blame silence because he's getting on my nerves, he's doing this, he's not listening, he's, he took the contract and he already beat me in competition, just whatever argument I want to blame him for. Guess who doesn't change in my blame conversation? Me. Let's just say Silas has a separate interest than I do. And Silas is saying, hey, I want to expand and grow and break off and do my own thing. Well, that also lets me know that as I grow my company, I'm going to hire more Silas's who are going to want to break off and do their own thing. How do I protect my organization as I expand it and design, redesign my organization that leaves room for people to break off and still not cripple my company? But if I blame, I miss that opportunity to learn that lesson and I spend time feeling self-righteous, but I'm still in the same place I was yesterday, day before, day before. But remind you, because your business is based upon competition, you don't get to stay the same. Business is not about acquiring a skill. You don't ever acquire business skill. Business is about constant growth. And the reason you have to engage in constant growth is because competition upsets your growth. 
If you reach this point right now and you're the best at what you do, competition says that only lasts for a little while because human beings are master copy and paste. So if you're not constantly growing and moving, you can't sustain your position in business, right? So at the end of the day, blame is a virus to growth. They did this to me, so. They did that to me, so. What are you going to do? That's the only value you have. Do you want to go to the moral judge and then be wear t-shirts that say I was morally superior last week and your bank account still empty? You're the richest, happiest person in the world. I mean, you're the brokest, happiest person in the world. Or do you use every opportunity that you, that you come across as an opportunity to growth? Just like pity. Pity is a waste of time. Oh, this is what happened to me. Y'all have no idea what happened to me. You're stuck. Sorry. I don't give a shit what it is. You're stuck. At the end of the day, tomorrow's going to move. The, the world's going to move forward except you. <laughs> you don't get to stop the world from moving forward. But in your brain, you can stay stuck and continue. to Because you're not moving forward, by default, you're going backwards. So waste your time with blaming and pity, sad stories, why me, I deserve. All those wasted points that we make to ourselves when we're going through something is actually self-destructive. So I just want to share that opening story. Uh, remember the way we got here originally in this conversation is a lot of stuff you're going to learn about tonight is tied to um, human instinct. So as you guys know, we've already hit um, radical responsibility. We hit the press secretary. And we hit defense. Next slide. Let's go to the next slide. So I want to tap a little bit about defense real quick. I want to give you guys some insights. Cool one. Um, let me start with this fun one first. Um, Shakina, if I'm 40 pounds overweight and I walk into your gym, give me some advice. And I'm gonna give you less than a minute to give me some advice. So give me your, your quick elevator speech. I'm, 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 30, I'm 40 pounds overweight. Give me some advice. Question first. Is your objective to lose weight? Hmm? Is your objective to lose weight? Yeah. So what question? Yeah. Okay. So you're trying, I'm trying. I'm trying to go. To, most people don't go to gym to, um, to find a new outfit. So let's just say we're trying to lose weight. <laughs> um, I would say first start off with your habits. Focus on the foundational things. Don't start off with anything too big or aggressive because most people bite off more than they can handle. Sleep, movement, regular basic walking, um, reducing overloaded stress levels and being mindful about what you're eating, increasing your fiber, eating more natural foods, and just trying to create new habits as opposed to over-restrictive processes. Okay. Sorry, somebody came to you and said, I want to lose some weight. How would you approach that? Mm. Avoid Krispy Kreme. <laughs> Um, <laughs> you know, watch your sugar intake. Mm -hmm. uh, um, be active every day. Okay. Yep. All right, Jasadi. Is somebody that's coming to you about? Um, um, let's re let's just assume they're exercising, but they still can't lose weight. What would be your advice? And I'm not gonna joke on this. <laughs> it's too easy. This is an easy joke. So this is a real question. Get your ass up. And go to the gym. Okay, but if the gym's no, not working by itself, what no. would you tell them? No, uh, wait, can you say it again? A friend of yours, just a friend of yours, hey, uh, I go to the gym, but it seems like I'm not losing weight. Just give your casual advice. I'm not, we not, nobody needs uh, to be acting like you have a gym. Just, just casual advice. Um, similar to, I was just be like, hey, like, look at what you're doing every day and try to find ways to, like, just switch up. So if you, looking at how you eat and seeing like, all right, if you notice you eat bad, like around this certain time, try to switch up and get like, a, find a healthier option to that. So just like swapping out the things that you usually do for like a healthier alternative. So what's, a, what's a healthy, healthy alternative? Give me, give me like two or three real quick. Um, so real quick, if you notice that like, you're really busy around this certain time trying to grab lunch, instead of going to McDonald's, there's like a healthier, like, the restaurant that I put you on to, like Catawba or whatever, you can go there and get like a healthy bowl instead of 
going to get a cheeseburger and fries um, or just getting like a, a, a pre-made salad from like a Safeway or something like that. If you're like, if you're trying to get something quick, but still get those nutrients in. Okay, give it to the last person, Fern. Fern just woke up to you. Hey, girl, trying to lose some goddamn weight. What 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 I do? Shit, I'm trying to too. <laughs> <laughs> you better call Shakina. <laughs> <laughs> call Tyrone. Huh? <laughs> you gonna keep talking? <laughs> huh? Okay, one more value. Go ahead. Go ahead. Listen. One valuable thing. Go ahead. She already has her own microphone. Cut it out. Go walk around like you'll give her a microphone. She's like, the only thing that I was going to add is to change your mindset and your people that you hang around when you work out. If you're already working out, you might not be working out with the right crowd, and it could just be your effort. How much of the other stuff you said was offense? How much of the stuff you think you said was defense? Were you more defensive heavy or offensive heavy? Let's make it simpler. Which one do you think you have more ownership in, offense or defense? So he said you should be eating. I could tell you Josadis was purely defense. He had no ownership in offense. When I asked him, what should you eat? You can go to a place like Catawba or something. Does that give a person power offensively? Go to the gym. Well, that, that's, that's defensive, but there's no ownership there, right? Um, you know, somebody says, stop smoking, right? That's not good health, right? He said, that's offensive or defensive? Defensive, right. Start doing what now if I stop smoking? I want you guys to think about that as you guys are moving in business. Are you advising clients more offensive or defensive? Do you own the offense just as much as you own the defense? Because remember, your culture is defensive by default. If you listen to black people talk, listen to our music, we talk defensive. So, for example, I can tell you what not to eat. You hear some people are like, yeah, I'm hella healthy. I don't eat pork. I don't eat beef. I don't do sugar. Okay, but what do you eat? What's your magnesium? Vitamin B, D, E, K, um, omega threes. Like, you realize, like, if you're deficient in those areas, you might as well smoke cigarettes. It's the same damn thing, right? Weight loss. Uh, the body needs 1.2 grams of protein. I think uh, 1.2, 1.6 grams of protein per per. Uh, get a kilogram a per a per kilogram of weight. So how much protein are you eating in your diet, right? Um, how much greens are you eating in your diet? How much processed food are you eating in your diets, right? Like if you don't, one of the reasons I think we struggle with dieting, or eating, or losing weight, because we have the defense part down. We don't have the offensive part down. If you're exercising, how much exercise should you do? What type of exercise should you be doing? How much cardio, how much weightlifting? You know, um, if you're not owning that offensive side, it's so, we're so defensively baked that if you look at how we solve our problems, if you reprimanding your child, are you using punishment or are you using incentives? Punishment is a defensive form of incentive, and incentives is an offensive form of, you know, it's offensive. Mm -hmm. So at the end of the day, how are you approaching a lot of problems in your life? Are you more defensive bound in addressing your problems than you are offensive? Just think about that. Go home and audit that. That's a question for you guys to audit and analyze. And if you don't have more offensive ownership, sit down and think about that process. Go ahead, Josadi. Um, I just need more explanation on that. Like, I'm still kind of confused. On so good. That's cool. I'm glad you asked that question. Um, People think about if I stop doing this, these things will happen better for me. What do you just start doing? If you're advising a client and you're like, don't do this, don't do that, don't do this, do this. Okay, but what should they do? Do you have the same amount of knowledge around what they do? Or do you just grab at the generic accepted do what to do? Go to gym, right? Do what? Like go run. Where? How? What's the difference between... A 50-year-old, 40-year-old, 30-year-old, 20. When you play offense, it's way more complex. 
right? Defense is really simple. Like, if somebody's gaining weight, you can all tell everybody, hey, just reduce your sugar, and that's pretty much. But then what should they be eating? What deficiencies are they dealing with? And that's where things get more and more complex. And it's a different kind of conversation and some things you won't own because some people have deeper deficiencies based upon some genetic challenges, right? That is causing a chain of reactions. So we're all following this generic copy and paste solution. We're treating the vice as is godly, as it's one idea applies to all. And that's when an idea, even a good idea becomes bad when you try to apply it to everybody. You get, get where I'm going with that now? Does it make any sense? Go ahead. <laughs> she shared her own. I'll let it go. I'm going to start right there because I saw. Oh, Tanil's not here? Don't share okay, the mic, Mike. Okay, go ahead. Uh, <laughs> I actually wanted to add on to what you're saying is that taking ownership sometimes <clears throat> um, doesn't even, how do I phrase it? If you are, say you have a back problem and you go to the PT, you come see me for massage, whatever, whatever. And then we tell you, hey, do this exercise, do this stretch. It almost doesn't even matter what exercise or stretch I give you. Research says that you'll get better simply because you are now a participant in your healing. That's, that's, that's 100%. Ownership, office of ownership, and how you move your life. You're probably going through most of your life going, even your relationships, I don't do this, I don't do that, but what do you do? Parenting, I don't do this, but what do you do? Like, do you have to say, like some of you guys will fight somebody over your defensive lines, but can't tell me, but don't have the same commitment or convictions around your offensive strategy. And it's okay. It's just an insight on defensive thinking that just kind of, when you go home and audit. So let me share another thing to you. So you guys know, historically, I've always said I hate flea market businesses, <laughs> right? If you knew me even further back, I hate earthly people. I used to say I hate earthly yes, people. Yes, that I, knew. I used to say, oh, I can't stand earthly people. <laughs> earthly people, you know, the hippies, modern day hippies. The whole tip. Okay. Um, only when you wear your certain office, Josh, I don't like you. So, and I would say often that I don't like soft people. Y'all want to hear the way I would say it? I hate these soft-ass motherfuckers. That's how I used to say it all the time. Now, people around me thought it was a statement of machismo, masculine, or macho behavior. I'm going to show you tonight. It's very fucking insightful. Passive, weak behavior is very different because I'm going to show you something else. That's going to, it's, 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 don't go to the extreme and think if you're on the other side of this. Because you if you're the other stream, you're also weak. But somebody who's very passive, eases in the conversation, tiptoe around subjects, kind of a fragile approach, that's all defensive. And it's toxic as fuck to building. You say, what do you mean? Let's say you have a group of people, say managers who don't want to offend anybody. And he's sending down communication to the team. The communication will be so vague because they removed everything that can offend somebody, make some embarrass somebody, or threaten somebody to the point you're almost saying nothing. The problem is that when you have a group of people who are working together who's scared to offend somebody, embarrass somebody, or threaten somebody, no one's addressing the harsh issues. We went to... Um, a social justice breakfast spot in San Diego. It was in a gay community and everybody was soft. Not gay soft, because I know a lot of gay people were not soft. A lot. But everybody was that super soft. That ah! Service sucked. The food was meh. It's part of a chain that has great food. You know what happens in those environments? No one's comfortable telling somebody else, giving them feedback that your shit sucks, your behavior sucks. The pay becomes equal because nobody wants to offend somebody and say, I pay you less because everybody will quit because they feel, I feel I deserve more because nobody's willing to confront it. A trick is that when you see a very, 
Oakland is suffering because we built so many defense. Everybody in government, and I can promise you, I can speak from the inside. They're so defensive. They're so soft trying to make everybody happy. Do you realize that if you want to destroy society, make, make it fair for everybody? If you do that equation, you know that's impossible. That means you will almost subsidize weak systems. The way the world works is a certain portion of society will say it's unfair for them, why it's fair for the majority of us, right? But if you make it fair for everybody, think about this. If you put out a policy for a thousand people and you sat in a room all day long and you process that policy, because we think so different as animals and we have different perspectives, somebody gonna say it's a stupid idea for them. So if you try to please everybody, you almost please nobody. Because what happens is you water, water, water to a point that you might as well not even say shit. You'll have meetings and you'll discuss nothing for a whole hour. And then your staff one day will say, why do we have such, so many meetings? Because we don't feel like we do anything. They don't, they don't achieve anything. They're in that position because the fragility of the people on the team, inability to be candid and speak directly to things they dislike, their, their, their discomfort. They even will put HR in position to punish you for being direct. You know, when Nana spoke to me in the meeting, I felt threatened. You should feel threatened. You trash. <laughs> That's real talk. How do you, in competition, you don't get to be, you don't get to get, be weak and win. And you're not in business to lose. So you could, if you want to do that, just go work for the government. You're in business to win. And so that means that you got to raise standards at all times because competition is such. However, often you buy, you bring that social justice soft energy into your group and no one can speak candid to no one. I don't give a shit about a sexual preference. Are you trash? I don't give a shit about your race. Are you trash? Or are you great? It's just, if that is the measurement of human behavior. It's, historically, we had a system that said, I don't care if you great, if you black, you're not in. But now we're in a situation where we're trying to equal the reward, equal the judgment, equal the treatment. If I'm an asshole every day and I do my job poorly and I'm always late, why are you treating me like the same person who's performing at a high level? Now, what are you saying to the person who's performing at a high level? If the, I'm performing at a super high level and you're performing at a weak level and I get paid the same amount of money, guess what's going to happen? Eventually, I'm going to start saying, I'm just going to get this check. I'm out of here. Y'all don't even value what I do. So now my top workers who can incentivize the rest of my workers is coming. They're, take, they're, they're falling out of position. And now my whole company's getting used to this lower level of work where we're all nice to each other, but we are trash. Because your bank account don't give a shit about niceness. It gives a shit about end results. So when you're in business, you cannot survive in business if your cost is higher than, than the amount of money you're making. Yet, if you run an organization that is making everybody comfortable, you can't afford to keep it open unless you have easy money. That's why you find like in nonprofits, organizations who don't really compete for, comp for, for resources, you'll find more of that social justice stuff. And it, it can work in those environments. But in business, it doesn't translate. I'm not, and I'm not giving you a license to be an asshole, dismissive, and hurt and destroy people. You still got to figure out ways to tell people they trash in the nicest possible way known to man. That's just something that you owe human beings in respect. But what you can, but that soft behavior, when you meet people who play that tiptoe, let me tell you, show you another area that tiptoe people do. It, let's say, um, uh, Shakina is the CEO of the company, and she's an asshole, absolute bad manager. But I'm the second in charge, and I'm always compensating to like protect her from herself. She's gonna have even a if you have a bad habit, and everybody around you stop you from confronting your habit. One day, it's gonna reach a point where no one can save you, and it's a calamity. But if I let you have your experiences by me step out the way and be like, "You asked for that. That's on you." That experience allows her to grow her management skill and become a great manager. So a lot of times when you're that nice person trying to make everybody comfortable, you're an enabler of defensive behavior that's damaging. You see how soft that soft shit don't work so well? 
So a lot of times you just you're as a human being, you like people who like you. So we're at this restaurant and the gay guy who's helping us is nice. He's really a nice person. He's real likable. And he's trash. <laughs> His skills was absolute trash. But he was really likable. So in the end, we we it's hard for us to process trash and likable in our brain. It just doesn't almost want to hold the same space. Right? Imagine, so in business, you'll see where you will hire somebody who's costing you money and you can't fire them, which that means you're also defensive because you can't fire them. Or you can't tell them, hey, let me talk to you real quick. I'm not having that again. You'll be like, okay, let's give them a chance. Maybe, maybe next time they'll do something different. Or let me give them one more time. Maybe they'll do something different again. They done did it 10 times. How many more fucking chances do you want to give them? But in your brain, you're so defensive that you don't want to feel that energy. So you play all these little tricky ways to get around the issue. You'll even tell the person, hey, won't you tell them to work on themselves? I, because if I, if I have to tell them, it's going to just be too bad. You're defensive. Now you're creating elephants in the room because there's things that's happening in your organization that no one can speak on because guess what? We're too scared to make that person uncomfortable. They might feel threatened. They might feel hurt. If y'all know anything about me, you've been around me long enough, I'm the quickest to be like, yo, you couldn't, when I used to teach photography, none of my pictures are really cool. I could have said, yeah, yeah, you know, they, they're kind of cool. I'd be like, this shit's whack. I don't understand why you call yourself a photographer yet. You got a lot to go, where to go. I didn't waste no time with your ego trying to waste our time. And most of those photographers that came to my class, I celebrate all their work today. Where you go to a college where they constantly defensively engage the students and guys will, and girls, guys and gals, <laughs> I'm gonna go back to the 60s or 40s, but women and men will come out of these colleges and they can't take a picture to save their fucking life and will tell you they're a photographer and got a degree in photography because they're not getting that honest feedback. When you're giving feedback, it requires bravery. But if you're defensive, you can't. You avoid it. You avoid conflicts. You avoid these different things. And what that happens is that you're, you allow problems to grow organically and just destroy your organization. Now, mind you, you have to know how to be, have empathy and speak to the human beings with respect, right? <clears throat> Try to train and develop people, invest in people. I'm, I'm in it with all that. It's when you get to a point where <clears throat> you water down all the, all the touch points in the organization that is designed to help us grow, you water it down because you're too fragile to enforce it. Is that cool? So defense ain't all, Argh! defense can also be, hi, how you doing? I'm very defensive. I don't want to feel anything. So I will avoid all the necessary friction. And if we're a team building a company, guess what? We signed up for friction. Whether it's deadlines, whether it's working on something you don't know, whether it's uh, getting in front of a crowd and speaking, whether it's giving somebody feedback, whether it's terminating someone, we signed up for friction. But what happened, what you're starting to find is that I don't want to offend nobody. Even in communication publicly, we get to a point where we can't spread worldly wisdom because we're too afraid to offend anybody. I had a... Um I was talking to a woman who's a, a great friend of mine. She, she was one of the people who launched Sephora here in the U.S. And now she's doing some other stuff where she's kind of competing with Sephora in the U.S. So that's interesting. Uh, but um, in the last six months, she's had to make some decisions on who's on the team. And I had a recent conversation with her, and she had to make a real hard decision. Um, and it was someone who, like, loved everything about the company, loved everything, super passionate person, but they were not in the right role for them. Mm. And, you know, they had to have that conversation. So I happened to talk to her after, and she was telling me, she was like, I'm going to be honest with you, two things that suck having to let people go and having to kick brands out of the stores. They suck. I hate those conversations. And I'll tell you this. Because she hates that conversation, she makes it worse. So she said, 
but you but you got to but you have to do it so i had i talked to her right after person came after college grew up there it was a lot of stuff but it was like this is not we're not i'm not setting her up and i'm not setting a team up it's it's, it's too it was too much and so she was like you know these these are really tough conversations and so i, I was i guess what i'm wanting to raise up is like yeah it is it is challenging like this whole thing around defense is so dope and so challenging and so like when you asked us to <laughs> Start journaling. Start paying attention to where you're defensive. I'll tell Tamara, I said, this shit is ridiculous. This is a shorter list to say, when am I not defensive? I'm fucking tired of looking at how the ways and I'm defensive. This shit is crazy. <laughs> um, and, and you laugh about it because you, you, you don't realize just how deep it runs until someone yeah. throws out a prompt like, hey, just look at it for the next week. And if you actually do that, you're like, good God, this shit is crazy. Yeah. But if everybody's doing that in a company and they are, but but it was it, it was interesting to see her to talk to her right after that because she was like man this is hard but but I can't I I also cannot risk this growing company and this growing team I can't risk other people who are starting who started to say I can't work with that this is what's compromised she was like well then we we have to make a call and we can't keep pushing her along because we do her a disservice so person crying. <laughs> she was like, it, it was it was challenging because as someone who kind of grew up under her, she was like, but we're we're no longer. Now we're starting to be a detriment, and it's starting to affect the rest of the team. And I, we just we just had to make a decision. But I just wanted to share that. Yeah, imagine imagine if in a defensive space, you have an employee. Let's say I'm Kaja's working with me, and um, as long as I'm talking to her in the process, if it comes down to a termination, she saw it coming. She said, "Yeah, okay." She'd be like, "She won't like it. No one likes getting fired." But she'd be like, "Yeah, okay." But this whole time, I've been like chummy with her. Kaja, what's up, girlfriend? And then one day, be like, Kaja, I'm letting you go. What? Do you understand why you not why you caught up in litigation now? Because <laughs> she's like, "Oh, you just let me go for no reason." Now her brain's gonna start making up conspiracies. Because at the end of the day, I was doing this. At the end of the day, I was this happened. At the end of the day, this happened. No, you just trash, right? And so. She would never know that. And also, too, she may have improved yeah. if I had the bravery to support her. Yeah. But if I don't have the bravery to support her, I also let her down, even when find her. So, yeah. yes, you should feel like trash because it's not just you let her down. Not, not only is, is she you trying to save the company, but your management is so fragile. Now, watch this. Let's say I'm talking to Kaja and Kaja gives me this long story like every time men talk to me I just I hate when men talk to me because they always demeaning and they devalue especially if a man uses his voice and tone so one day I see Tasha, Tasha doing something wrong and I go ooh if I say something to her I might be in that defensive space she said I'm in defensive loop with her now her defense has framed how I can talk to her so now I'm holding back compiling accumulating all of this Tense like friction between us to one day I just finally exp blow up on her and say, You know what, Kaja? I don't give a shit. You get your chick ass up out of here, right? I done said too much. I'm out of context. Why? Because <laughs> I've been so defensive responding to her defense mm -hmm. that now when I explode, I'm way out of context, which now rewards her with, Oh, I got litigation showing up. Mm -hmm. You guys get on going with this? Bravery, soft ass people, look, just how is, is, he's, he's becoming a professional shooter. That's his hobby. If you own a gun, I trust a brave person over a coward any day. Because you know what a coward would do? They shoot first. And as Joe Pesci on that show, uh, Goodfellas, he was a coward. A strong person, when you meet a strong person, they know, do not use this gun unless it's absolutely necessary. A coward grabs a gun in a sec A coward will get a knock at the door at night and start shooting through the door. Right? Y'all think being soft is like this innocent puppy or innocent kitten. When I, so when I say I dislike soft people, you make this soft association and go, oh, not I hate puppies and kittens. <laughs> That's not what I just said. 
I'm showing you how soft behavior in a building culture is damaging and destructive. And it seems because it, it wears the facade of being innocent and accessible is highly damaging. You guys get that? Go ahead. I was wondering if you could dig into a little bit more when you were saying that if she, um, referring to Shabisha's story, if she feels like those conversations are comfortable, she's going to make it worse. Can you? Can you? Because she's that? avoiding a lot of conversations that, that should have been had way before then. Okay. There's a lot of days that she came in. You looked at the paperwork. You were like, oh, let me just help it for help her because you didn't. You were trying to avoid that conversation, or you may get back to her and be like, hey, could you just word check this through AI or something? But it's, you're oh, you're almost there. Like all those times you avoided having those harsh conversations. Because see, if I'm having harsh conversations and let you know, hey, listen, I've talked to you two or three times. If you don't get to this line here, it's not going to work for me. But it, or I just ignore. I don't want to look at what you're doing. As long as nobody's talking about you, I don't need to look at you. Because at the end of the day, I'm not really here to make people hurt people's feelings. I don't wake up in the morning going, who can I hurt or not hurt? It's, I'm trying to protect the team. I can't bring in an entry-level designer and pay them equal to Danielle. I expect Danielle to be like, oh, this is great. And, or I can't jam Danielle up about some shit with somebody who's equal to her. And then when they show up, be like, oh, you know, hey, listen here. I understand. Work on it. You know, hey. I have, a, have the consistency that makes me uncomfortable is necessary for the strength of the organization. Like, <clears throat> as harsh as I was in my photography class, we produced some of the dopest photographers in the Bay Area, right? And, but I didn't change for nobody. When Shakina first came in, nice looking woman. But she got that, she got that, she got that conversation day one. No one, Josh came in, <clears throat> nice guy. Clowned him so hard, it was ridiculous because he was talking too much shit. I, I had to just check that shit at the door, <laughs> right? <laughs> Shut up. And so, <laughs> <laughs> so, so <laughs> the reality is that, like, the consistency of me being able to confront those uncomfortable conversations, if one day I say, hey, listen, you're not, you're not really meant to be a photographer. We don't have enough conversations. You know what it is. You're not mad at me. But if I, this whole time I'd be like, yo, I think, oh man, this is cool. No, nah, you cool, you cool, you cool. Then one day he's like, Nani, can you can I can I can I do the lead on the photo show? I'd be like, oh hell no. You look at me like, wait, what? Why can't I take lead? I thought you said I was cool. Well, I didn't really say you wasn't cool. But why didn't you say anything all this time? See, now you still understand how I betrayed you? Because I wasn't given as a leader, we're not talking about a manager, as a leader of an organization or as you design a system, I need meetings to be honest and candid. Like, remember in the book of of uh, 15 laws of, uh, of uh, 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 what is it called? Conscious, Conscious leadership, yeah. I'll tell you, that's funny. <laughs> what is it called? I signed the goddamn book. Okay, 15 laws of conscious leadership. He says, you must be candid. You must be candid. What's he saying? Don't let that cowardly shit inside your organization. I don't want to say nothing. But we'll go over here and gossip. I don't want to say nothing. Now your company becomes toxic, and as a human being, you can feel the toxic energy. You don't, you don't even know what it's about. Just something feels wrong. People cutting their eyes, people sh 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 uh, shutting down your conversation, people not really listening to you, people not engaging you the same, people not asking you to take ownership because you let that trash grow inside the organization. You guys can see it. So I'm showing you the other side of, okay, must be candid. Why you must be candid and protect the candid tone in your organization so it protects the growth, the innovation, the strength, and the evolution of your organization. Anything else compromises you. So that when I say I don't like soft shit, that's what I'm talking about. I love kids. There's A lot of kids are soft by nature. That's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about that person Oh, I don't want to, oh, did I offend you? Oh, my God, oh, oh, sorry, oh, no, oh, ha, ha. get the fuck up out of here. You you have no value. You, If I bring you to my organization, you will create a toxic behavior. You know, Nana, the other day, um, you was talking to Neil, and I, I overheard, and I don't know how I feel about that right now. And I talked to Neil about it, and I think, you know, I talked to Neil that as a woman, she shouldn't receive that from you. Do you know I just lost $80,000 from her? Oh, I didn't know that, I'm sorry. Get your punk ass over here. 
I don't like soft people for a reason. They're quietly toxic, and most people don't see it because they wear the facade of being, they, they tie themselves to the images of a child or a kitten or a puppy, and you're going, oh, my God, they're so nice. And they're so likable. Oh, they're so likable. How could they be so, they wouldn't hurt a fly. Yeah, they just destroy your organization, but they won't hurt a fly. In the name of being soft. Next slide. All right, I'm going to just do this real quick. I'm going to say this real quick, and I'll come back to this again in a minute. One of our number one goals right now, and every black person can listen to me, Latino folks who can listen to me, um, Jewish folks, y'all just, just chill for me. Go wash some dishes. Come back. Irish folks be like, yeah, that shit, that shit happened in Ireland. Um, we were in San Diego. I lost for one week the use of my swivel muscles. My neck never swiveled. I'm walking down the street, I felt so fucking safe. Ridiculously safe. Like nothing, almost nothing's gonna happen. And I saw a lot of new businesses trying new ideas. I saw like open, some of these businesses, you're like, wait, what, what's that? You saw foot traffic in a lot of places. You saw parking encouraged. One of our number one goals, black folks, is we want to bring this crime shit down. You can't grow new ideas with crime. Crime steals jobs from youth. It steals jobs from adults. It's almost like the snake is eating his own tail till it kills itself. This crime shit is so crazy. And then you watch, how in the fuck do they sell to us gangster culture? Do you realize, let's go to the other side of that pendulum about soft ass people. People who are angry, defensive, quick to anger, gangsterism is a characteristic of weakness. There's nothing strong about a gangster. There's nothing strong about a gangster. Why do you become a gangster? Because you're weak. Why do you respond like a gangster? You're weak. Can you build anything like a gangster? No. You build for a temporary second, but can you sustain it? No. Unless you get the license to start killing hella people. You can, let, you can rule through fear for a little while, but fear means that somebody's going to be bold enough to kill you. There's nothing about the gangster culture that is strong. But somehow, somebody told us that that is strong and being humble is weak. But being humble is one of the strongest fucking attributes you can develop. Do you realize by being humble, you can grow faster, build faster, and create faster, and gain more power faster? Yet, somehow, we put the fucking trash music of hip-hop in our house every day and prime our kids to take over where we left off. We don't even design our schools to say, hey, it is a must to create anti-gangster education. We're losing by this culture. Gangster culture literally rebrands a city to make it to uninvite money. <laughs> I'm going to tell money, don't come here because you ain't going to be able to expand your money here. <laughs> That's literally what gangster culture is. Gangster culture is setting up where you're destroying education, you're destroying money, you're destroying comfort, safety. Do you realize, going back to the way the brain works, if you live in a neighborhood where the fire engine is running every night, you can't outperform a kid who lives in a neighborhood where they hear no fire engine. Because every time the brain hears a fire engine run, whether you sleep or not, it burns resources. So it keeps continuing to burn those resources. So when it's time to sit down in front of education, you have less resources than a kid who sits in a neighborhood where it's quiet. Even if racism did not exist, Walnut Creek, Walnut Creek kids are going to whoop your ass, inner city kid. There's going to be some inner city kids that are going to benefit from hard times and scarcity and have a higher level of creativity, athleticism, and certain things like this. But thinking capabilities? Your kid has to walk through hoods to get to the fucking school. They gotta be around a low level of thinking, being, and existing. And I'm gonna get into how we played a role and how we continue to play a role in that. But at some point, y'all, you have to know, like right now, if I decide I want to take my family out to dinner and spend three, four hundred dollars for dinner, 
I'm not going to Oakland. That's a problem. I ain't the only one. So when son and daughter says, hey, mom, I want a job at 16, 17, there ain't no jobs left because all the businesses keep leaving. I'm in San Diego. When things are safe, innovative ideas have the opportunity to grow new businesses. But when things are, when crime is high, it's hard for businesses to expand and grow. Foot traffic is compromised. So many different things are compromised is ridiculous. Education, foot traffic, health. We're in a um, rich neighborhood in San Diego. And we're into cafes. And Jordan would be almost, he would probably be almost plus size in his neighborhood. Everybody's thin. Everybody's thin. Everybody's thin. It's, it's a, a, a thick person, like most of us, was one every hour. And they go to the hood, and most of y'all thin. Crime ain't, we're not winning, y'all. We're not winning. And as businesses, you must make this a priority in everything you do to reduce this crime. And not reduce crime like putting people in jail. That's trash. Change the mindset of crime. Crime, once it starts, it feeds itself. And once people can game it, it's a race to the bottom. So that means that, so for example, if I'm driving down the street, I don't run stop signs. Because once I sell that to, the, to Shorty, then after a while, once enough people catch on, you'll see white businessmen running the same stop sign. Because as a human being, we start to copy behavior that we figure we can win from, especially if it's a lower behavior. So human beings, we love to gamify shit. That's why when they was giving black folks money, I hated that shit. Because if human beings find a way to gamify it, we're going to gamify it. And once we gamify it, we destroy ourselves. We morally become worse. We start to eat and destroy everything. We start to shit where we eat. Graffiti on the walls. Tire marks in the middle of the streets. Property values going down. I want to get into real estate. Where? You can't do it in your own town now. Grandma who bought the house a long time ago, she can't even get her fucking equity because you keep tearing shit up. Like you don't realize how bad, when you realize the effects of crime and all the effects and the effects it begets and the effects it begets, you realize, oh shit, crime is so fucking, it is, Mark, Malcolm X even said, if you want to stop economic growth, grow crime. It is, and crime is not bad people, it's bad behavior subconsciously taking over our youth. And there's no counter system to stop the process. That's one of the reasons I want to become an entrepreneur. Because I can influence systems, I can change behavior. Like, I used to think the dumbest shit I've ever heard is, I'm the coldest gangster out here. <laughs> it's not, what the fuck is that? What the fuck is that? It's one of the games you rise to the top and you die. <laughs> you rise to the top, you go to jail. There's no such thing. If a gangster means that I will kill anybody and other gangsters will kill anybody, then you guys are just playing Russian roulette. There's no win from that. Gangsters don't have values that are so enriching to the community that you're like, then those values really make our communities better. It destroys our communities. You're taking the worst of our, our slave values and you're putting gold teeth on them. The gangster is a walking slave billboard and doesn't even fucking know it. If you're in business and you being and you just being taking on the personality of a, of, a, of a gangster, I promise you, you can't build or can you work on a team. Now, if y'all go to the old, old, old gangster, that's a different gangster. This new shit we selling through hip hop is trash. It's been trash for a long time. It ain't it ain't this new generation. It was in my generation. Cut it out. I used to remember this old man said, "What's wrong with this new generation?" I said, "Y'all didn't do your job." <laughs> and that really comes down to us now it's our turn to do our job but I would argue that if you want to see a city where I mean we're in San Diego and young men are riding electric bicycles through the neighborhood without a care in the world no cars going crazy they not going crazy no emotional just you're like god damn this is kind of cool see the youngsters out here playing having fun Look at East Oakland. 
our kids play a different in a different concrete jungle. That shit is not healthy, y'all. So how are we supposed to collaborate when we all get to, or we're all gangsters? Gangsters don't collaborate well. We're like, you know, you're the thing with ants is ants are cool, true to their tribe, but if another ant comes into that col that, that um, colony that's not from that colony, that other ant that ant instantly becomes very dangerous and kills that other ant. I don't give a shit. You could be the same breed of ant. What are you doing here? I'm killing you. How in the fuck we move around acting like ants in a world that's becoming more and more human by the day to put it's becoming AI and we're moving like ants still. We gotta raise that fucking bar. Next slide. That was my only like. This shit is so cold and y'all don't know it's cold yet until I explain it. Do you appeal to interest or do you appeal to reasoning? So, this concept is a two-sided coin. And I got this from Charlie Munger, who got it from um, um, Benjamin. Benjamin Graham. Huh? Benjamin Graham. Benjamin Graham. And the concept is, um, when you're working with the public, never appeal to their reasoning. Always appeal to their interests. Which means, Learn about incentives. I'm going to tell y'all a story and stick with me. Young girls, cover, put some cotton in their ears. Kids, go outside. Josh, <laughs> I don't want to hear your stories. Um, when I was a young man, I used to watch, I used to hang out with a lot of younger women because, you know, when you're young, young, you were too I was too scared to deal with rejection. So I would try to work the friendship pipeline, right? So I kind of be cool with them, and then maybe one day be like, yo, what's up? And I would watch women do this thing, and mind you, this is not about women, because everybody does, all human beings do this, and all race do this, do the same thing. But it was a lesson I learned that, get, I, I learned to live on the other side of that coin as I got older. And I would watch a woman tell me that a man ain't no good. He ain't worth 10 cents to a nickel. That I saw him out last night with another woman. That he's a cheater. He's a liar. He ain't no good. And next week, I found out she was in his apartment hanging out. I'm keeping it clean because we got young folks around us. And you realize, you mean ra your reasoning didn't override your interest? No. Then when I got on the other side of the fence, I would tell a woman, I say, listen, this is what's going to be tonight. Oh, I ain't going to do all that. I wouldn't even talk no more. Go in here and make me a sandwich. Because I know when I come out this room, you're going to still be here. Because I know your interest is going to override your reasoning. In business, some of us try to run businesses, and we try to run businesses from a space of reasoning. But in all cases, pay attention to the incentives. In all cases, pay attention to human incentives. It's way more powerful than reasoning. Sometimes you, you're in this class and you're learning all these lessons and you're so quick to take your reasoning and then go out to the real world and start running a business as a reasonable business and you realize you're missing something. Incentives. Pay attention to what human beings are interested in and to they're not. And be prepared to move. But when you go out there and listen to their reasoning, often you will miss their interests. Reasoning is, I want a car to get me from here to there. Interest is, I want a red Corvette. It don't even make no sense, like I got kids. But I want that red Corvette. So I buy this red Corvette and buy me a used truck because that's my interest. But reasonable would be buy that van, that minivan. Most men would tell you, we're gonna skip that interest their reasoning, and go to the interest of, why well, I get an SUV. You guys see I'm going with this? One more second, I'm, I'm, I'm coming to you next. Let's say somebody's talking to you right now and they're telling you, hey, Yapasua, you should pursue this idea or you should buy my product or my service. And my words are convincing. And everything I say, your biases are taking off and, I, and you almost can't hear anything besides what I'm saying because you're like, that shit makes a lot of sense. The way you save yourself in that conversation from being taken, ask yourself, 
What is his incentive? If somebody, if you're talking to somebody, one of your employees, and they're in an interview, and they're telling you about how they are morally superior and all the great things they've done, if you pay attention to the sentence, you realize this is a waste of dialogue. Just listen to it, but get rid of this shit as fast as possible because they're incentivized to tell you these lies. In their mind, they might not be lying to you, but they're incentivized. Once you follow the path of incentive behavior, everything looks different, right? Oh, PDD, I'm going to just use this one, and I don't know the truth, and I, I don't have an opinion until I, the facts come out. Oh, PDD did all these horrible things with these girls. Okay, but what was the girl's incentives of being there? The person who watched it, why were they there? What was their incentives? And I promise you, if you follow the incentives, the story changes. Once you learn to follow the path of incentives and control and create incentives, you, you will realize incentives have so much power, it's beyond your comprehension. Go back to my days of, in the game. I would run a game on a woman, and I know that I'm talking to her incentives. Everybody in the room would swear to God she would never do what the fuck I just said. There's all, all signs and all wisdom says there's no way in the world she would do A, B, or C. But now I knew the incentive game then. I didn't know the language for it. And as everybody would tell, talk to me like, no, nah, no, nah, she's reasonable. She's this. She comes from her father's a preacher. And, and she just, and she just led the, the march on women's equality. And she's a feminist. And she would never, she wears jeans when other women would wear dresses. There's no way in the world she would mess with you. She's as soft as a kitten. You're just too goddamn macho, Nana. She doesn't like your type. She don't even like brothers from the hood who drives cars like yours. And I'm listening the whole time going, blah, 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 because her sister says she'd be over there night. I guess who's knocking on my door at night time? You know, I don't really mess with guys like you, but something about you just attracts me. I know, girl. I see your incentives. Your clients are the exact same way. If you understand their incentives, you know how to design your marketing. You know how to design your business. You know how to communicate to your clients. You know what color your windows should be. You know what color your couches should be. You know how to approach somebody. Once you can map people's incentives. Quite often, you guys get caught into reasoning, and you are, somebody hires you in a company. And my job is, I'm incentivized to do a good job to get a promotion. I'm not incentivized for when the fuck happens after that. So when you're talking to me, and you're talking about the end result of what's going to happen down the road, you're not talking my language. That's not what I'm incentivized to hear. I'm incentivized, I'm going to look good. I might even get a promotion. Oh, let's go. When black people hire, when black woman puts me on, I realize the most important thing for me to do is make her look good because if she looks good, I converted her to a soldier for me in corporate America, which will go give me more jobs while I'm at home sleep. I understood her incentives. But some of y'all in there reasoning with them, you know, as a person who's experienced like womanhood and where we come as a culture and how we've evolved, you know, I, this is why you make no money. Wisdom has its place. It's a tool. But I'd be damned if I write with a drill. It makes no sense. These tools we have are important tools. They have their place. You guys are treating every, you're using the same tools for everything. When you understand human beings, you can see corruption in the system unfolding. You can design a poor payment system and create corruption amongst your employees. Because you incentivize them to say, if you do this, you get more money. They'll be like, okay, well, shit. Because as human beings, incentive is an invisible language that speaks to us. Now, what's the other side of that? But as an entrepreneur, can you learn to move beyond the interests? Let's say you're online. And everybody's saying, we're doing this. Some of y'all can't move past that. You say, well, that's what I'm going to do too. Some black folks never had anybody wise in your life. And all, of you, all your knowledge and wisdom comes from interest, not rationalization. This is what everybody does. I learned this from everybody. This is what everybody says. This is, what, this is a new trend right now. This is how everybody dress. This is why I bought these shoes. Everything you do is driven by interest, not reasoning. That's the other side of the coin. So can you move in that space when no when the reason when it works in your interest and know how to use interest when it works within your reasoning. You guys get that? 
Any questions on that? I'm, I'm giving you a number of strategies. These are heavyweight strategies on how to move the needle forward. If you get this interest game, if you, and mind you, when I give you this game, do me a favor. Don't stop here. Go home and look this shit up. Learn more about interest. Incentives, excuse me, about incentives. Once you learn more about incentives, you realize, oh my God, this is a fucking superpower. Yes, it's one of the greatest superpowers in the game. Why are people incentivized to walk through your door? Be very clear, not because, I hear this shit all the time. Here's, here's a misalignment. They came here because I have, the, I have the best orange juice in the business. No, they came here because they could see other men. They came here because they could see women. What the fuck wrong with you? <laughs> and if you don't enhance that and you keep making more fucking orange juice, you wonder why they went to the, those business down the street because they designed a business that says, y'all want to meet each other? Huh? Huh? <laughs> Y'all like, but my orange, I don't understand, their orange just sucks. I don't understand why they're over there. You, you're not paying attention to your customer's incentive why they're there. Go ahead. Um, so I have a two-layered question. So when you're running a company, we have, what, three sets of incentives, essentially. We have ours, the person the person that's like owning the business, the staff that's supporting, and then the customers that we're trying to attract. Oftentimes when we're trying to figure out incentives, um, it's kind of like a subconscious thing. Most people aren't gonna lead and say, I'm incentivized to come to a gym because I really wanna be sexier and I have lower confidence and so I'm working on myself, but I'm gonna tell you I wanna lose weight because I wanna be healthy, but it's really just because I don't have confidence. Versus a staff member might say, like, I'm incentivized. I want to move out of my parents' house or I want to be able to afford actually living in the Bay and not transfer, you know. But, like, how do you uncover those incentives? Because um, most people, even if you ask them directly, won't answer directly because they're not aware of it. Yeah. Um, they are aware of it. Okay, so one thing is everything you just said was a person who understands incentives to their ego. Because everything you just said was really bad. Um, let me help you with that. Incentives never really, they don't always stay the same. Well, some, most of the time. There's sometimes it can stay the same. Like at the end of the day, people are incentivized to eat. We, do, we can't avoid that one, right? Can't incentivize to sleep, incentivized to take care of our kids. <sighs> incentives is a discovery. You know the best time to discover is incentives? In letting people just talk loosely. Control dialogue means control output. It means that it's poor insights. If I can get you really comfortable and just start talking, a person can tell you what they think about you more in a casual conversation than if you ask them directly, what do you think about me? Once you say that, they don't go into like, press secretaries gonna kick in and say, uh, you're amazing, red hair, huh, huh, black on? I, who wears black besides you? I think that's just amazing. I don't know what to say. Uh, um, the other day you smile, and I, I don't know. I just I got happy. I, that's why you're great, huh? But it's the things I won't and will say will give you more insights on deeper conversations. I might say while I'm talking to you, like, yeah, Shakina, yeah, oh, it's a good workout because this weekend I'm about to show up. I'm going to have my outfit on. But oh, okay. Or I might say something like, you know, I'm really starting to feel better about myself now. I mean, I'm here like to lose weight and everything, do everything you say. But like, I feel like now when I go with my friends, my status is going to change because when they go hiking, I will feel different about you. Will hear, and then you start finding common incentives. And then you know how to put the right language and the right things in your business and position things correctly because I'm speaking to your, your needs. Although, but here's where gyms can go wrong. You guys will project incentives and not hear the incentives. Or when they speak to you, you're filtering it through what you want to hear. You got to learn to hear people. And this is where a lot of dot coms do really well. They are fine what really drives people, and they're just really focusing on that incentive. Where you're all over here going, you're focusing on the traditional way that that business shows up to the customer, and that's not room for innovation. If I'm going to engage your product, why am I here? If you don't get that, you don't get like what's driving me as a human being, what makes me make decisions, then you're really just projecting this thing of I'm trying to get you to, to like me, not I'm analyzing you and I'm using incentives to lock a relationship in. It's different between I want you to like me. You could be really nice to somebody and do what you think they want because you're trying to get play this likability game. Incentives is like you got to be clear on what I'm asking for. 
that I'm not telling you. It might be that my husband just left me. I'm a woman. My husband just left me. And <clears throat> I feel like I gained weight and I want to reset my body to be attracted to the next mate. And you over here talking about, uh, you want to do this weightlifting competition? No. I want to get me another husband. <laughs> so mm-hmm. train me right. <laughs> like it's just it's like this test it's whole conversation. <laughs> Go ahead. <laughs> so last week one of the things court talked about was subjective By the way, court did a basic when you guys get a chance to like learn this stuff more and more and more, and you go back and watch last week's class, mm-hmm. it was very theatrical the way he did it. It was really dope. I listened to the whole class, actually really enjoyed it. Um, but great class last week. Go ahead. Yeah, he. I enjoyed it as well. And he talked about subjective reality versus objective reality. Yes. And there was a point where I asked a question, and he said that in his observation, I was in between the two. Okay. Which I actually, when I thought about it over the week, I was like, that's a good thing for this very reason, because... <laughs> I understand that, player. You know what I'm saying? When I thought about me, I was like, shit, I'm perfect. What I'm talking about? Go ahead. Tell me how wonderful you are. <laughs> <laughs> if, if you're over-anchored Say in what? objective what? reality, no, just play it. <laughs> i.e. reasoning, mm-hmm. it's hard for you to get in the subjective mind of your customer so that you can appeal to the interest. So in him teaching it, do I understand that that is for you to know, but apply it strategically, or is it just for you to know? No, okay, so let me be very clear. I know where you're coming from because when I heard the lesson, Court was teaching, there's, he's teaching it in layers. Mm-hmm. So, and a lot of these ideas and principles change as you, depending on how you apply them. There's no single, like most strategies have a, a yin and yang. Variable. And what he's highlighting is a lot of us, when we go into working on our business development, business decisions, business strategy, we're not grounded. We're really into like what I feel, what I think, what I heard. Then by the time we get to the customer, you can't even see them anyway. You got to get to a point I would, I, where I was shaking my head no is you got to have strong grounding to even be able to properly hear incentives. Now you got to learn the science of hearing. There's lots of people teaching this class are some of the characteristics of incentives, some of the signs of incentives. But when you teach these principles to people who are not grounded, it seems like the, their, their air balloon just gets higher. And most of the time, by the time they come to us with a plan, they're not even talking to real people no more. They're just in their head. They came with this perfect mastery strategy that has no access to human, other human beings besides what's in their head. So what court was trying to do is get you guys to ground yourself. And then grounding um, then you can get to a point where you can start getting into the space of because court also is in the basketball industry. And the basketball industry is subjective, right? But those who run a subjective industry have a very firm understanding of the objective to be able to run a subjective business, right? I Meaning you have to understand how human beings work. Otherwise, two subjective people is called pop culture. Oh, you're lovely. Well, you're lovely. I see you. I see you. You're wonderful, girl. You're wonderful, too. Neither one of us is making anybody happy. We, we both depressed as fuck. We can't see each other. We can't support each other. But we both happy, smiling each other. That's two, sub, that's two subjective people. Objective person is here. You go, how you doing? I'm like, no. But really, stop. How are you doing? What's going on with you? And you see with a lot of pop people, they're going straight crying if you ever did that shit. Oh, God. You want to let your ass be? I don't feel as good as I'm saying. <laughs> Fuck, man, I don't know if I want to ask you no more. So to that point that you just made, two subjective people cancel each other out. Subjective <laughs> and objective. Ooh, get me out that room. <laughs> <laughs> subjective and objective. Could there be a model in which it is an objective person talking to a subjective person and the objective person knows how to appear subjective in order to gain the trust of the subjective person. So, like, if yeah, but it has to be, but it still has to be rooted in objective thinking, right? Because if, because you could, like, for example, if I'm in a room with somebody and it's just not the space for me to, like, I go to a barber shop. I was telling some um, Scott this: if you're, if you're, this, the shit with me and we talk about the five T media. If we go to a barber shop with that shit, it doesn't translate. So in the end, I might be like, yeah, yeah, no, nah, that's cool, man. No, nah, you're right, man. No, nah, no. Nah. I'm telling you right now, if Michael Jordan was president, everything would be different. I feel you, though. I feel you. I feel you. Right? And 
just you don't cut my hair though, right? <laughs> like it's I work with kid five year olds. They're in a subjective world. I know how to play the game with them, right? But as the parent, I still need to understand the objective responsibilities I have as an adult in that space. So yes, subjective is a tool of the of the objectives, right? But we're not both. I'm not subjective and objective. I use subjective tools. When I create a brand, a trademark, you can't make a billion dollars without using subjective tools, by the way. But you have to objectively know how to use those tools. <laughs> and what happens is that when you have a subjective person trying to use subjective tools, they start believing that shit's real. No, the NBA is real. I'm telling you, Jesus would have been on the NBA. Boy, boy no, no. <laughs> no, there's no Jesus in the NBA. <laughs> <laughs> so, so subject, objective, you can't command those tools in a subjective space. And what Core was trying to do is get folks to say, he, we see it all the time, especially when you're doing the work with people, is more people are creating so many make believes to deal with harsh realities to the point that they, they lost contact with reality. And so when we try, they finally try to have a real conversation, it's scary to us. We're like, what the hell? So that's why I said, he was creating a theatrical experience and his whole, his whole class was a piece. It wasn't really separate pieces. It was one piece that created a single dope ass idea. That's why I thought it was amazing and I couldn't stop listening to it. All right. Cool on, cool on incentives. We'll come back to that in the future, but learn the incentive game like you learn another you know game. Another thing too is this. This is important and hear this, this is very important. Every time in this class, you learn a new idea, don't assign that idea to a single purpose. If you design a road, not only one car can drive down that road, right? Some of you guys will learn these ideas and then assign one problem to one solution. All these ideas are designed to accommodate multiple challenges in different arenas. So if you build this new road or this new pathway in your brain, design it where you can, you can just respond to semis, sport cars, um, family vehicles, um, tractors, it can carry all, that's how strategies work. Where sometimes I hear you guys talk about strategies and you guys are telling me you have a problem and you will call out the strategy but you don't see the association because you tie that strategy to one single problem. So you make, your, you make all your strategies very monolithically connected and I realize that every strategy is designed to create models in your mind. Where you tie them together and so when you have a new problem you go, how does this model fit here or does it even apply? Do I need to find a new piece to add to it? You don't move in a world that's uncertain looking for straight line connections because those connections are being broken every day and being recreated because of competition. You guys get that? Okay. Next slide. This is all strategy. I hope you guys are writing this down. Here is, you ever heard somebody say, I'm doing strategic planning? There's no such thing. There's no such thing as strategic planning. Scott. There's no such thing as strategic planning. Anybody want to debate that? I just, okay, I'll give you a chance. I'll give you a chance. <laughs> and you need to, now in corporations, they use it all the time. It's common language. Strategic planning. You know where they can't be the same? Because one you own and one you don't. Which one you think you own? Nope. You only own planning. Plan is yours. Strategy requires the customer. I can try whatever the fuck I want. If it doesn't work, it's not a strategy. So strategy is a feedback dependent process. So when I say, I'm gonna plan something that I control and I assume I control the strategy, I don't control the strategy. If you go, go sell something right now, as confident as you may plan on doing, pack up your van, put the shit in the back of your van, drive to location, Set up, plan out the whole design, plan to sit there in a the room, plan your welcome to Kaja's famous cake, the whole, the whole, plan your outfits and everything. Does that guarantee success? So how does strategy and plan become the same thing? Because strategy is how do you get the customer to come buy that product and pay what you want them to pay. Planning is what you intend on doing to get them to do it. That's why I don't like business plans, because we think business plans is a strategy. It's not. If you make a business plan just to plan, this is what I plan on doing. But realize it's about to be disrupted once you get into the game. We are in the same, we're cool. It's when you run a business plan and then over leverage it like a strategy. 
You can plan for the next 10 years, but customers say you don't have control over the next 10 years. That's why long-term planning sounds funny to a lot of people in business. Mashama still believes in 100-year plans. I'm like, what the fuck are you doing that for? But anyway, I can't see 100 years in front of me. I can plan today. Okay, here's the thing that blew my mind. So I'm 56. When I was 20s and 30s, I said, this is how the world should be. This is how I was always being. This is what, this is what a society should be. So, for example, I thought Oakland... Um, Black folks in Oakland should be doing this. By the time I die, that might not even be a thing. So if I have a 100-year plan, and black people at that time see themselves different, move different, define themselves different, and have different goals because, okay, uh, what's the cartoons with the little Smurfy things? Not the Smurfs, the new ones, the new one. Trolls, trolls, trolls. Oh. <laughs> like I'm a grown ass man. If I if I know all that shit, y'all be like, so you 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 into that like that, huh? So trolls. Uh Kev, when you was younger and I said, Do you listen to Backstreet Boys, how would you respond it? Alright. <laughs> okay, no, no. In the nineties, if you listen to Backstreet Boys and you was black, Backstreet Boys, right? That's the white ones, right? Yeah. That was seen as corny as black for black men. That was corny. That's corny as hell. Um, Justin Bieber and all, not just Bieber, but the guys back then, the, the, the white bands, because they were, they were, they were, they were in sync and, yeah, look, man, I, I didn't listen to shit, so I don't, I don't need to know, and I ain't gonna still gonna listen to shit. Anyway, so at that time, we didn't let that music get in our house because it was, we felt like they were still in black music and putting white faces on it to cross over to pop culture, right? Like they were the Elvis Presley of the time, and we were offended. If you listen to black folks doing the Elvis Presley time, they'll tell you, oh, Elvis Presley stole our music, and we were offended, right? My kids watched the Trolls, and they know all those songs, and I watched the little girls the other day sing one of those songs, word for word, and the adults, I'm so excited, right? And I'm sitting there going, wow, that's an evolution. If I made a plan that says, hey, we got to get soul music back, we're going to do all these different things in the 90s, that generation of my daughter may come along and be like, what are you, what are you dad, I don't know what the fuck, that, what, are you, what are you fighting for, man? I mean, that culture's going to evolve in ways you can't imagine. You don't really own the future. If you own the future, we all be rich. That's, that's, that's a superpower of predicting. We don't predict, right? Now, you can plan with anticipation that if this happened, I would do this, if this happened, I would do that, if this was happening, do that. But really your strength of moving forward in a volatile world that's always changing is constant growth. That's the superpower of how to, to navigate a world that's always evolving, not planning. So strategy, and why this is important, when you think about your business, you're trying to control your strategy, that means you gotta constantly be listening and taking insights and getting feedback to control the strategy. When you're planning, it's, we reached a point where we have this hypothesis of what we want to do and we're going to plan. But the plan and strategy putting together implies that you have control of both and you don't. You control planning, you don't control strategy. And if you start saying that, watch how your brain will, if you could pull those two apart, watch it empowers you to own them differently. Because then you realize, when it's time to work on our strategy, okay, well then what feedback do we have from our customers, the public, cultural trends, who we're focusing on, who we're narrowing our focus on, I mean, what's the size of our sample size, what's our sources of uh, uh, listening to our customer, are we listening online, are we listening in person, do we have boots on the ground, are we doing observations, are we just asking questions, what are we doing? I need to have some insights so we can develop a strategy. Without the insights, I don't have nothing for you. Because planning is taking our ego. The ego tells you whatever you do is going to work. That's what the ego says, whatever you do is going to work. Fern, if you do, it's going to work. It's you. Fern, everything you touch is, come on, don't have a question to me. Haven't everything I've done in the past work? As we all know, it doesn't work that way. So when you have strategical, when your planning becomes contaminated with strategical thinking, I mean, when your strategy becomes contaminated with planning thinking, you start to move a strategy as if I commanded it will work. But when you realize my planning is what I want to do, but, but if I'm talking about strategy, it's based upon what the community is telling me. It's the hypothesis, actually, based upon my observation of culture. And if my observations are off, it's probably because I need to continue to grow my knowledge in my observations. 
So if you don't have deep insight on human behavior and human patterns and complex systems, then your strategy sucks. If your biases are so strong that you override your analysis, I mean, I'm watching what's happened, but my brain is changing my lens and I see what I want to see. My strategy sucks. So if somebody, you hire somebody and they say, you say, I'm going to hire you as a strategist. And you're just talking to them in casual conversation and they can't see reality for shit. They're not strategists. They're egotistical strategists who think planning, they think they control the outcome. Somebody who controls strategy, you don't control the outcome. Go ahead. Give her mic. We need, she needs a microphone, somebody. Just uh, you gonna make Josiah lose 10 pounds up in here. Ooh, that shirt is already getting looser. Go ahead. Oh, on my shirt, bro. Hey, hey man, it's so in our face, we can't avoid it. Go ahead. Sit down, billboard. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Yo, walking billboard. <laughs> <laughs> so I want to be sure that I'm understanding how you're defining each of these for the purpose of the conversation. Because I agree with what you said. Neither with a strategy or a plan are you guaranteed an outcome. No, planning, you, you can control that. You can say, I plan to get up tomorrow morning within reason, right? If you die, right? Mm -hmm. But you say, I plan to get up at 6 o'clock tomorrow morning. Set your alarm clock, get up at 6 o'clock in the morning. Now, what you do with that plan and the outcome and return of that you got to be very clear you don't control that. Right. Whereas sometimes we mix, when we put those two words together, we think the planning and the strategy protects the outcome. And then we, so let's say I hire, I hire silence. I'm like, I got this plan, and I got this deadline, I got this other deadline, I got this other deadline, and when these deadlines are over, this is going to happen, I plan on having this, and if you miss that deadline, you're going to destroy everything I'm doing. Mm -hmm. how, 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 how. How is that possible again? Well, because my plan, because I, I'm so serious about things we don't talk. Yeah, okay, but <laughs> you're so hypnotized by the plan, you're not seeing the context of how it aligns with the strategy. And strategy is totally different. And at the end of the day, it's like, if I designed this to you for you this month, and it still hasn't went through a customer engagement process, and you spend all that money on this plan because it was so well put together, because you call it a strategic plan. And then when it gets into the public, it absolutely fails because you couldn't pull the two ideas apart. But if you put them apart, you would have built the plan to build something way over here. Test, 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 adjust, test, 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 adjust, test, 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 ready for strategy, implement. Right, but when you think planning strategy, you think because it went through my head and my team sat down and processed the conversation. The outcome offers a subtle guarantee. No. No, I agree with that. So let me make sure I'm clear. Are you saying that a research driven a research driven strategy and a hypothesized plan that you're prepared to see not come to fruition because you'll get some data out of that? Like where is research in this? In this if you own strategy, then you will leverage research. If you think strategy and planning is together, you will over leverage the intelligence of the team. Okay. And that happens all the time. All the, okay. All the time. You know, he's, he went to Harvard and he came and he worked with us and he's achieved great goals in the past. And he suggested that we should go this way. Okay, how do we test it? See that? See the difference? That's because of my brain separates the two. But if I thought the planning was strategical, I will tell everybody, show up on Sunday, we're about to blow this shit up. We're about to, man, tell the bank we need a loan, we're about to get paid. And then you undevelop. If you decide to invest in developers, interest rates are higher, higher level of volatility, right? Even though this developer is developing this land doesn't mean it's a guaranteed sale and there's more reasons things can go wrong, right? So a bank knows there's a difference between what the developer is planning on doing and strategically what they can do. Very different. But what happens is when people are trying to sell their personal value to other people, I have a strategic plan. What the fuck is that? <laughs> like separate the two. You have a plan. Cool. Mm -hmm. All right. So now your plan is this is this is how you're going to manage these, this process. But your strategy is being informed by what? You are this, the customer. And if you don't have a clear pipeline that doesn't get distorted because somehow you're trying to mix the two together and you start thinking your, your, your plan is going to override the customer feedback, I see that shit all the time in business. 
So the research informs government the strategy. The strategy informs the plan. Understanding that none yes. of them may be accurate. Strategy informs the plan. And what happens a lot of times in, in, in inward facing, especially corporate, corporate America, or especially government, really government, planning informs the strategy. There's a, there's a man, um, Steve Blank. He's a he's a um, tech dude. He's made a lot of money. Uh, he just makes companies run. And he one of the things that he, he has a famous quote that no plan ever survives first contact with the customer ever. And he he tells stories about having to fire marketing people, having to fire other people because they refuse to pivot from the plan. And he's like, you're getting data that it's not working. And he pulled over and said, you got to go, dude. Like, we're not doing this. And the person was like, why are you doing this? We have a plan. He was like, that is not working. <laughs> so we're going to move on. Thank you. But he paid them a lot of money to stick to a plan, and they couldn't pivot. You guys get that? Strategy does not, planning does not trump strategy. And by the way, culture eats strategy for lunch. Go ahead. Um, when you first brought this up and you were like, debate me, I know we've um, delved into strategic planning just so our team can have a, a guide map for the year. And the way that we've gone about it is these are the things that we want to test for the year. These are the, these are the, um, and we come and look at it and, and see what's going on. But it's like, um, we get, we, we've taken the feedback from what we've seen over the last year. Um, we see what works, what hasn't worked. We're making our tweaks. And now we say, oh, we want to look at what happens if we move this lever or what happens if we move this lever. And we call it a, a strategic plan just because I guess that's what, that's what it has, you know, that's, that's the, the coin phrase or whatever. Right, but, you, okay, that's problems. But remember, we're the workers as a culture. We're not the builders. So a lot of times we copy and paste a lot of bad habits, good and bad. Some of them come with academic titles behind them, even researchers behind them, but we're the workers. If you teach a team to, co to combine planning and strategy together, they move with entitlement or false expectations. You destroy the humility of the team. If you say... I don't understand why the customer didn't. What the fuck you mean you don't understand why the customer didn't? <laughs> like, does it, does it fucking matter? Like, let's figure it out, right? Or the customer was tripping. Is, is that a thing? Is that possibly a thing? And they won't, they won't say it to you because they incentivize not to. Remember that. But when they're interacting with the customer, they're like, they're like here. No, he, I don't understand why they won't take it. Here. What the fuck is wrong with her? Here. They're at a wine event. Why are you passing them water, bro? They don't want no goddamn water. Right, because you didn't, because in the end, well, if you were working on standards, you were like, here, hey, they didn't take it. Let's try something else. If I'm really anchored in strategy, right? Or let's write that down and get that back to the firm because here's some stuff I've noticed in the process. In the end, but if you plan, you're going to go to the crowd trying to figure out, okay, they might be tripping. Here, okay, they tripping too. Here, you know, we might be dealing with the wrong people or something. I don't know. So is it more so... Um based around how the team may interpret? Everything, you too. Like you gotta really pull those apart and literally own them separately. And, and say that, that strategy drives my planning. And if, if something happens strategically where I get feedback from the different, plan just change, y'all. Yeah. And it always change. But I don't make those two, they don't, they don't stick, that's not a, that's not, they don't stick together. They, they don't rely upon each other. I mean, they're not, strategical planning implies that my planning has strategical value. And it's like, your strategy, your planning is adjusted by the strategy. Otherwise, you're kind of looking at strategy like it's um, a six-step move, like a recipe. It's not a recipe. Planning is not a recipe. Planning is relative to what you're engaging in competition. Okay. So I can't say you always do one, two, three. Sometimes you might do two, one, three, one, right? But that's because you're listening and you're adjusting and you're, you're looking at all the data where some companies will literally stick to their plan to their death. So just to underscore Nana's point about why they have to be kept separate, the actual phrase is strategic planning process, which is big organizations coordinate these two pieces, but they have to do it across so many people. So it is an ongoing process. 
So there's no such thing as a strategic plan. There's a strategic planning process. So it's important to know that because it helps to understand why those two things are separate. So that loop that Nana was just talking about, how one inform informs the other, informs the other, that's the rhythm or the process that an organization goes through. They're not combining, you, not saying they don't combine them, but the actual thing is it's not combined. It's dangerous, very, very dangerous because your ego is, you're not working with, nobody's AI. So when you start, if you, if you echo an ideology too long, our brain will start to make it, try to make it work. Regardless of what we, regardless of what we see, we see what we want to see. Our organization can see. They always say the man who, the man who feeds me, I will sing his song. Or the man, yeah, the man who feeds me bread, I will sing his song. Meaning that if somebody feeds you, like a corporation or a business, or there's some kind of incentives, go back to incentives, some kind of incentives, you will only see what the incentives tell you to see. Is that some cool shit? A lot, of, a lot of big companies have failed behind that. I'm talking about like Enron type shit where how do you get all these people to participate in a foul accounting scheme? Because the man who feeds me, I will sing his song. So why you have to have clarity because some of you guys can create corruption mm -hmm. unintentionally. Next slide. Shabisha, read this, read this real quick. This is hella cold. Go ahead. Always invert. No, no, go back. That's okay. the next slide. What the, who did that? That is the next. That's the next slide. We never did that slide. Yeah, you can know. Go ahead. Okay. Refer <laughs> inference refers to the process of drawing conclusions or making educated guesses based on evidence, reasoning, or context. It involves using available information to arrive at a logical conclusion or opinion. How many of you guys heard the word inference before? Okay. I'm gonna show you guys something real quick. And I'm gonna show you something that's, that's cold as fuck. So you gotta manage, and something that causes a lot of abuse in our community. I see Jasadi, I say Jasadi. Oh, let me use Josh. He's easier, he does red. <laughs> so, <laughs> so I said, Josh, um, last week you did a horrible job and um, your work around the video. Now, if you overheard that, that's very clear, right? Nana told Josh he did a horrible job. Josh probably did a horrible job or probably he assumed that Josh did a horrible job, right? That's, that's clear, right? There's another layer to that conflict called the, the rung effect. Rung is like a ladder. So next layer, la next layer to that conversation, same conversation. Josh, you did a horrible job. What I feel is I need to tell Josh you did a hard, horrible job because he's hurting the team. And I'm getting frustrated. Josh hears the same thing and his brain goes, that was harsh and I felt disrespected. Shut up. So, um, so, there's, that's, that's, a hidden that's one hidden layer. Then there's a layer of inference. What was my philosophy that made me say, Josh, you did a horrible job? And what is Josh's philosophy when he heard it? And did it translate? The inference, inferences are deep, deep why. So when you work with a group of people, this is why you can't say something to thousands of people and they all hear the same thing. I may say to you, hey, we all need to get up and stand up for what we believe in. But based upon our inference, everybody heard something different. But my brain and what most of us do, we assume my inference is your inference. You know what I just said? We assume my inference is your inference. Let's say me and Shabisha started a company together. And I'm talking to her every day. I don't realize as I'm talking to her every day, we're, we're exchanging inference in our regular conversation, right? So when I say, hey, Shabisha, we need to stand up and represent, she knows what that means because she understands my inference. Mm. But now let's say I got 20 employees. I say, everybody, we need to stand up and represent. And some people just leave right then. You're like, what the fuck? 
Some people feel violated. Some people says, oh, you don't realize my people don't stand up like that. Or when I was younger, I have trauma from standing up. White people who came to the black community who wanted to help us from an honest heart, they weren't bad people. They were good people. Really, really good people who wanted to help you. They didn't see your inference. I gave you $1,000. How come you didn't make 3000 That's what I would have did. See the inference difference? I provide you with this opportunity. How come I would have done the same thing? This is why people who help people are trash. Because the people they're helping, they don't see the inference differences. We assume inferences all the time. And this is what causes relationship arguments. This is what causes uh, parenting arguments. This is called bad business communications. This, is, this causes so many communication challenges. By default, race does not define diversity. Your family is diverse. <laughs> Some of y'all relationships are diverse as hell. <laughs> Your kids are absolutely diverse. So when you talk to people, you are automatically speaking to a different inference. Can you make the adjustment and learn to hear the inference of the people you're talking to or learn how to, even as a company, train everybody to embrace the inference that you have as a company? So if you work for 5T Media, we have a 5T Media inference. If you work there, we're pushing Deeper wise, so if I make a move, everybody on the team kind of like, yeah, I know what Donna's going to do. Oh, I knew what I knew what Shock going to do. I knew what Scott's going to do. I knew what Dre's going to do. Because we have a core inference of what is our why? Why do we do this? Why do we do that? What are we thinking? What's our motivation? What's our incentive for where we, why we're here? That way it becomes a thing where our team gels and collaborates way better. But when you just assume I told 12 employees to do this and they just couldn't do the shit right. What's their inference? What's their deepest rationalization of how they move, how they process, how they think? You're in a relationship. And you say, I thought when I said this, it hurt my feelings. Why? Because you should have. That's an inference distortion. How the fuck do they know what that is? You both love each other, but you guys have different inferences of how to express your love. So when you say you should have done this and I watched you for two weeks and you didn't do this, which implied that you didn't, you don't care for me, you assumed my inference and then made a judgment. That means that's all you. I ain't got shit to do with this conversation. What do you want me to say? Oh, dumb, smiley face. What the fuck do I do? This happens all. You hire, let's say you hire a Latin kid, a white kid, an Asian kid, an African kid. And you go like, well, I told them what to do. I designed it. I designed the incentives. I don't stand why they're not doing it. Because they all have different inferences. And if you don't start to train their inference, don't be surprised if you have fracturing amongst your team. Go ahead. How do you trade inferences? It's because it's, it's, you have them design a learning-based organization. And in that learning and in having conversations, this is why working from home is dangerous. Because when you work from home, everybody starts to split their inferences, right? I need us to think like Google. I need us to think like Bank of America. I need us to think like Apple. So when somebody engages with you, how would an Apple employee talk about this situation? Otherwise, how do you protect your brand if we all have different inferences? If everybody has a different response to the same problem out of 100 employees, guess what's going to happen? So guess what happens around the water cooler? We're exchanging inferences. When we get together and we work on certain projects and we talk a lot and we spend a lot of time, we, we, what we're doing is we're creating a core inference and then we're preaching internal branding, your organization internal branding. You're pushing, this is why we do what we do. This is why we're here. This is what we care about. This is what we're trying to protect. That's shaping the internal inference of the organization. You guys get that? I mean, you guys get that? That's just important as fuck. This is why being superficial with somebody all the time and just trying to be nice, going back to the soft people, they're not passing back and forth inference. What they kind of do, they kind of do have an inference. They, yeah, well, I guess they do. But it's important in an organization to say, this is why we do what we do. This is how we do it. When we do this, this is why we do it this way. This is why. It could change, but our why, this is why, where we stand on stuff. How we move in this world. How we talk to people. How we show up in the morning. Because otherwise, if we don't gain inference clarity, because we're a war-based animal, we will start to assume that people are 
working against us when we just have different differences. There's a person who can piss you off like a motherfucker right now. If you learn how to reach a person's inference, you'll learn, oh, they were doing it because they were scared. The average gangster is scared. You know that, right? The average, gangs, gangster, the average gangster is working from an inference of fear. If you understand that, you can see the child behind the gangster. But if you see the gangster, you see the surface, not the person. How do you help the black community if you judge them without understanding their inference? How do you get rid of crime if you don't see the inference? How do you build schools for kids if you don't see the inference? Which is, what's your motivation, what's your reasoning? How are you processing the world? All that's so critical to like understanding how to engage the world around you and how to build smart teams is understanding inference. I, black people, it happens to all, you, okay, so modern, it happened to black folks all my whole life. But you see it in gay community. White people, oh, he's gay, and they just assume his inference. He's trans, they assume his inference. They don't say, Trans, what the fuck do they do with the person's inference? I can be trans and be an asshole. Be a horrible person. Right? But assume, we just assume the inference. We don't even, you hire somebody that's trans and then you start treating them based upon the inference you project on that person, not realizing they don't fuck with that shit. <laughs> They're not with it. They're a damaged employee about to damage your company or the amazing employee that's about to blow your company up. You don't know what, what through your assumption of somebody's inference. And in the social justice world, we just do these soft, we do all these inference projections and assumptions. We don't see nobody. Nobody sees nobody anymore. Well, that's cool for you if you're not a, if you're not building something. But if you're building something, you got to learn to see people and realize, huh? What's your inference? And you start seeing some commonality and some connections and and some hurting of, of certain inferences. But without clarity, if you see a dude in a hoodie and he's acting very violent. If you don't understand that person's inference, it's easy for you to categorize that person and throw them away in your brain, not realizing that's a valuable asset in front of you. Go ahead. Not for me, but for maybe somebody else in the room. <coughs> Can you go over the meaning of inference just so we're all on the same page? So, okay. That's a difference right here. <laughs> it's, it's in your brain... When you see something happening in front of you, you draw this conclusion, analysis, educated guess that's based upon abstract reasoning, right? You don't 100% know. It's, when Fern was talking about strategic planning, she was expressing an inference. We use strategic planning, she don't own the language yet because she accepted that inference from somebody else, right? But if she would sit down and say, let me process it, her reasoning she can have more ownership of her reasoning. We do it all the time. Like, in a sense, a lot of black culture from hip hop music, we assume the inference and then we shape ourselves accordingly, but we don't understand that. We don't understand. We have no context to it. If you act like an entertainer or somebody famous, you don't get their inference and their motivation. Maybe I'm getting paid to act like this, but you really going to act like this in a real neighborhood? <laughs> that makes almost. It's going to be destructive for you because this works on camera because I'm incentivized. And I'm speaking to this copy and paste of human behavior like your why and my why. If I don't understand it, I can misunderstand it and even lose the value or um, miss an opportunity. There's so many things you just miss. And so when you're building a team, you got to listen to the team beyond what comes out of their mouth to what is their inference. And when you hear the emphasis, you will hear it. You know who's in your on your team and how to show up in those conversations to get what you want out of your team. You even hear the incentives because their rationalization, how they process in the world. You can even see their reaction before it happens. But most of us don't listen that far. We listen to labels, and labels are not people. We all wear we all wear clothes. And that's not who we are. We're just like we wear labels. Nana, can you? Um, just because research and feedback has come up a lot tonight, something like um, demographics, would you say that that's an inference? And it, it, 
using that, like, what's the limitations of it, and what's the what what would you say are benefits of using that to inform strategy? It, it's, 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 it's getting you closer to your hypothesis. And demographics is it's just a clue. It's not the actual inference, right? That's why in, in insights we ask questions uh, and we do observations. Mm -hmm. With observations, we can't see inference. Because you ask questions, I can code what I want to tell you based upon my comfort zone with this stranger. So that doesn't give me inference. Inference usually happens. Um, if you just let a person talk and share their reasoning, they, they start sharing the inferences. In our reasoning, in our conversation, what we saw. I can tell you about a movie and how I felt about a movie. I'm telling you about my inferences. Mm -hmm. Where a lot of times we don't hear that, we hear what we want to hear. We don't hear people. We don't see people. Okay, so is this what you're doing when you're asking me, Tanil? tell me more about that. Explain to me. Yeah, absolutely. Gotcha. Because otherwise, <laughs> I'm, if, if, I, if I just assume, if you say, I did this, and I go, oh, she probably did it because of this. I'm not talking to you anymore. So then later on, when I try to show up to you, and you're like, Nana, you don't never hear me or see me. Or I feel like this is a horrible experience working with you. It's because I don't take time to go, hmm, why, why, why did you do it? And sometimes I, mean, I, may, I, may, I may need to tweak your inference to say, hey, if you keep that inference, by default, even in your good intent, you will produce this negative outcome. That's why I listen to people. So that first layer is one thing. I heard what he said. That's why YouTube is trash. Mm hmm I heard, I heard, she said, he said, she responded. Without inference, without deeper insight and rationalization and what's going on behind the scenes, you've heard nothing. You've heard nothing. You only hear something. That's why there's so many questions and observations that has to happen. Because even contextual, when you understand what's happening, there might be this inference that's buried multiple layers back. That's creating, that's, that's giving energy to all these actions that are invisible to the common conversation. But if you just listen to a person, you'll say, Oh shit, they really way over here. And if you finally, I know somebody in Oakland, can't call it his name. He walks around, he roars, right? And everybody's scared of him. I promise you, more people scared of his brother than a little bit. Yeah, I read his inference and I brought, I, made, I turned him into a child again in the conversation. But I read his inference. I didn't come at him like, I didn't fight with him because if I fought his, his character, we probably would have been physically fighting. Right, I didn't. I didn't try to respond to his characteristics. But I, once I like heard him, heard him, heard him. I heard it. I heard it. And then he said something else. Heard it. Right. And then I asked a couple of questions to kind of like to play with my hypothesis. Then I finally said a couple of words. He's like, "Oh, well, no, no. It's because his whole tone changed." But when I hear his inference, I can't speak to him. I would have been like everybody else, like, "Oh, yeah, he's tripping. He's really a good ass person." who's dealing with some issues on that we can't see and most people will never see. But when you start hiring a lot of people, you're gonna deal with that shit. You're gonna deal with that shit. Contractors, employees, vendors, you're gonna deal with that shit. <laughs> and if you don't learn to see inferences, you'll find yourself in a very rigid world. I feel like you're playing tennis with your personality. You're going back and forth with all your emotions. <laughs> Next slide. Oh, go, where's the invert one? I thought we had an invert one. Did we skip invert? Yeah, an invert. Go, go, go back to invert. Go back to invert. Yo, I'm giving y'all so much game. This is all business shit. Like everything I'm telling y'all right now is business. And if y'all don't see how it applies to business, just say, hey, I don't see how it applies to me. And I promise you, always invert. Anybody knows what inverting is? Go ahead, Fern. That would be for me. Um, is the opposite true? Um, how whatever it is, is the complete opposite? Is the complete negative of what I'm thinking potentially true? That's partially overt. That's that's part. That's also inverted. That's a form of inverting. That's correct. That's correct. What else is inverting? Anybody else? Any other form of inverting? Go ahead, Kasha. Let me get Kasha microphone. There you go. To Look at something from more than one side, or to turn it inside out. No, okay. But, it's, but that's 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 a good. First of all, Kaja, I don't think Kaja, Shabisha, Shakina, 
Um, and those of you who participate, Tanil, everything ain't about you, okay? <laughs> <laughs> you know, like this. <laughs> I swear to God. Hey, y'all don't realize, like, when I was listening to the class at home, you guys are actually adding to the flavor of the class. So I want to say thank you all a lot. And, and Kaja, a lot of questions you ask are really good questions. Are those questions that could be assumed but not spoken? And, from, and it requires, I just like your questions. I like your questions. Um, so I want to tell you that in person. I really like your questions. And when you're at home listening to it, you don't realize how much value you have in your questions. So just keep doing that. So an ex in the street who I didn't know was watching Hope, and they said, well, I see you on there asking all the questions. <laughs> it made me not want to say another word. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, no. Ask your questions. Ask your questions. And yes, and I, we run across, I run across a lot of people that take Hope online and it is, it is a pleasant experience and also it's just it's also gonna makes my heart warm to see all the black folks at home who are working on improving themselves that's always a pleasure to see um so some problems cannot be solved if you don't invert usually when we solve a problem we look forward i'm going to do this i gotta do this i gotta solve the problem i gotta do this this is this invert is go to the end and say to yourself if I'm at the end, what could destroy this success? That's one way of inverting. So you literally sit down and go, hey, let's write a list. We're here now. We, we're, we've got a company that's running successful. What, could, what, what would make us not get here? What, what, what are some things that would just destroy us? You'd be surprised what your brain will find. Then you could ask this other question. Here's another one thing. Start your plan backwards. Go backwards in your planning. So for example, my wife would plan sometimes and she would make all these small mistakes because she was moving forward. So she wouldn't think, if I do this, it may offend Tennille. If I do this, it may, Fern might be offended. If I do this, Kaja might not like it. Because she's moving forward. And she just won't, your human biases just won't let you see it. And I would, until this week, until the last week, I, I taught her inversion. And she was like, this changes everything, right? But the reason I would catch a lot of things she couldn't catch, I would go the other way around. I would get to the end of the event and go, okay, what could go wrong? What could be missing? What would have not to be in place? What are some common things? That, now, because I'm working the plan backwards, I would see a lot more points of failure than she could see. I would see a lot more opportunities that she could not see, right? And all of a sudden, she's like, it's a superpower because when you're going forward, you're a victim of biases. The way you get around your personal biases, go in reverse. And when you go in reverse, your brain turns down your protective part of your brain and allows you to see more flaws. Okay, watch this. Hip-hop music. Going forward, bad music, trash, right? Culturally damaging. We need to stop it. We need to uh, come up with alternative music. We need to, you see how I'm going? That's offensive forward, right? I'm going to invert the problem. Hmm. If hip-hop was to go away, what would have to be true? If hip hop was never to be able to go away, well, it would also have to be true. So, which then let me say, huh, why does hip hop, if hip hop is to be successful, what has to be true? Oh, that means that it's fitting a need. It incentivizes it's incentive and it fits a need. What needs does it fit? Right? Then you realize, how does young people learn worldly wisdom? Where do they go for worldly wisdom? If, if, if young people want to gain wisdom, where do they go? Huh? You see what's the problem? You see the you see the vacuum? Schools don't teach worldly wisdom. A lot of churches don't teach worldly wisdom anymore. Because they don't teach the Bible from a wisdom perspective. They teach it from a fear perspective. Right? So guess what the young people did? They created their own communication channel of what? Wisdom. Wisdom transfer. Young person says, This is how I live, this is what I'm doing, so I'm gonna get down and listen to me. So it becomes the only voice of wisdom for young people. Is the problem hard to solve anymore? You see the difference? But if you go forward, 
all these kids, they ain't going to let it go. They said this. You see, when you go forward, all the biases and all the unnecessary friction, but you reverse, you realize, oh, here's the gaps that are missing. Here's the holes. Here are the opportunities to build something that can actually work and transfer the space. And then here's what does hip hop do really well? We can, let's look at what does hip hop do really well and what could what would destroy hip hop tomorrow? Then as you design a system to capture that audience, you almost learn how to design it from going backwards. Solving the black community, go backwards. Watch, it become, watch you start to see more solutions if you go forward. And all your difficult problems, invert. Always, always invert. Go look at the problem forward and look at it backwards. Even in your writing, if you want to improve your writing, read it backwards. Inversion is a super problem solving tool. Always, anytime you have a problem in life, Go backwards. What has to be true? What could destroy what I'm trying to do? Go backwards. A lot of chess players play backwards. They, don't play, they invert in their game, their strategy. They don't, they don't have 20 moves forward, 45 moves forward. It's like 3, million moves in, 3 billion moves in chess. You don't know all that damn moves. It's a ridiculous amount of moves. What they do is they play by saying, if I do this, what could happen? What are the different, if I make this move, what are the different things that can happen that's negative? And then what happens in chess, they play inversion until the last few, full, full, the last few moves, and then they have the go-to moves in the end. But the reality is that in most strategical engagement, most strategists, we invert. If you want to solve a problem with a big group of people, play inversion games. Okay, we want to achieve this idea. What's the best way to destroy that idea? Then you know where not to do. <laughs> we know exactly where we should not be at. As a, as a, this is a super powerful tool of harnessing a team of people to solve complex problems by inverting the problems. Invert. Always, always, always. When you're running across a problem that seems bigger than you or it's giving you a headache, just invert it. Work with a team. When you work with a team, that seems difficult. You know, first work with a team because sometimes the team may possess the creativity you're looking for. But once you invert, watch how everything. It's just like things you could never see. That's why a lot of times you're like, why can't we solve a lot of problems in the black community? Because we're thinking forward. Think backwards. If we were free, what would it look like? What would we, what would we need to be free? Remember I said to you that the way I became, I changed my pro-blackness because somebody asked me, if you don't understand freedom, you're not black, you're not pro-black. That was an invert, he made an inverting, invert, inver inversion statement. He inverted my thinking to say, oh, think the opposite in reverse, because all, you, all your anger and mad at the white man, and I'm an activist, I'm a defend, I'm a block, I'm gonna stop this. I was all, there's no, I was not inverted. Once I inverted my thinking, I realized, okay, so what would freedom look like? And what could destroy our freedom? And how do you have to think about freedom? So that once I had to take a, a ownership of the offense of my defensive thoughts, I'm in an offensive realm. And that's when I realized how much I did not know, which made me hungry for, oh shit, once I inverted, I realized that's not gonna work. If we stay on this path of this, it's not gonna be, if you destroy the white man tomorrow, just say we got into revolution. This is old school, 60s revolution. We're gonna do a revolution, 1965. We're gonna get rid of the white man. <coughs> The whole economy collapses, we go into turmoil, we start killing and fighting each other. Is that what you want to do? It's not, a, it's not a smart move anymore, is it? But if you don't invert, it sounds really good because you're mad. You see the difference? Once you invert, you realize you could override your anger, your emotions, dumbass idea. Politics, certain leaders in politics, not most, but some leaders in politics, if you invert, it makes sense. If you don't invert, it doesn't make any sense. You go backwards, you say, oh shit, that's real. We want to do this. Oh shit, that makes sense. Okay, we all carry guns, right? Now, if the population is like, let's say Oakland was 50,000 people. If I shot at my nephew, chances of me hitting somebody is pretty low. What about when the population gets to almost half a million? I shoot my nephew, I kill kids. So you see how, oh, California be tripping on guns. Invert it. I ain't tripping that much. 
you say, well, what do you mean they not tripping that much? The way you dis- 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 where you change the incentive of guns is create friction around it and you reduce the interaction of guns. You still don't get it. Like, for example, if I want you to slow you down using gas, just keep raising the prices. <laughs> I'm de-incentivizing you to use gas and I'm incentivizing you to buy electrical vehicles. But I can't tell you to buy electrical vehicles as a human because you're like, don't control me. Okay, cool. Just raise gas prices. You, you see where I'm going with this? Like, invert. When you invert, things make sense. If you don't invert, you'll be at the barbershop with everybody else. That's some stupid ass shit. That's stupid. That's dumb. That's stupid watching YouTube videos. See? He said it's stupid. I, that makes stupid. Oh my God, dude. Invert. If you invert, it starts to make sense. Always. Always. When you plan. When, you observe, when you're observing something. Go the opposite direction in your thoughts. Um... Lady's trying to sell us, we're, trying, we're buying this cabinet that's going to cost us about 20 grand. We originally got a quote of 35 to 46 grand for this cabinet. So I found a custom maker who's going to do it for 20. I told Mashama, I want to get it on 17 to 18. Mashama inverse instantly, so there was no problem. Somebody who was married to the process, like, 17 to 18, we got 20, that's a better price. Invert. Three years from now, five years from now, ten years from now, would we like that cabinet the same? That, that cabinet that we love today could be a big ass piece of old ass furniture sitting inside of our space that I spent twenty grand from. So that means that in the, in the beginning, spend as little as possible because you're probably going to change this shit out within five or six years. Don't overcommit. Invert told me what to do, but if I use my emotions that's pushing me forward, I won't see that strategy. I think, oh, I got to save some money. I really want it. I deserve what I, de- I deserve. What I deserve. I worked really hard. We got the money for it. Let's go for it. Invert says, I don't give a fuck how much money you got. You're not going to like it that damn long. Invert. You could like it that long, but what's the chances of that? You might like it, you might not. Tight. You might like half of it and have the shit halfway toward now to bring the guy back for another 10 grand. Right? Lady who came in who's designing our office, she's like, yo, you know, you should just get all new furniture and I can get it discounted, which is only two or $300 more than a used furniture. Invert. Furniture is not like that in modern day culture. We don't know what the future of offices are. I designed my new office more like a cafe. It's really pretty. And two, um, I'm designing for flexible movement. So you can work here, work there, work here, work there, as opposed to sit at this desk in this big ass space, right? Third thing is, I, because, I, because the future is so uncertain of how to design the office for the future worker, over investing and over anchoring myself in today's standards is foolish. Go into it at a minimal cost. Don't put my value on trial and be like, well, if I brought cheap, she won't think I'm cheap. I don't give a fuck what you think. I can't fuck about running my company because I'm inverting. As I invert, it makes no sense. Now, if I listen to her and get caught up in emotions, my biases, my value might start to go on trial, and all of a sudden, I'm plopping down this money, and $200 here, $200 here extra on 30 or 40 pieces, mm-hmm. that's six grand I just give away. Eight grand I just give away. Right? And this happens to people all the time. We go to a car salesperson. When they say you go to a car salesperson, they sell you a car, invert everything they say. Watch this, it's super power. You're like, oh, it's just easy. Yeah. Like, you know, hey man, I've been here all day long. And uh, I'm here because I'm just trying to sell you a car. Invert. Well, wait, what would you have been done if I wasn't here? You've been here all day long. You don't get the fuck out of my office with this shit. I'm inverting everything you say. You know, we give you the best deal we can. Invert. If I leave here, no matter what you sell the car to me, you're winning. So, and if you can't sell it, you're not. So it's in my interest to exploit the opportunity. Your emotions are is getting in my way. I wish you just stopped talking, mm-hmm. right? I, as I am, like if you talk to me, I'm inverting everything you're doing and I'm looking at the end. When I get to the other end, if I spend this extra 5,000 markup because no one's selling this car, after I get past those three or four days of status, what I feel like the dumbest ass of all time. God forbid, and then turn around and tell my daughter, look, that hundred dollar toy you want is just too much. But you just spent five thousand dollars for status that you only have for three days. Well, if you want three days of status, I can figure out the ways to spend that five thousand dollars. Invert. The world changes when you invert. But if you don't think forward on everything, you realize some problems are not meant to think forward. And guess what the slave never meant learned is how to invert. It's impossible for white supremacy to hold black people back. 
if you invert it. What would white people have to do to hold you back as a group? They have to agree. When is the last time you seen white people agree? <laughs> they don't. So in the end, you let one more person take the, the myth of the super white people and go, we don't want you to have this job. You're like, oh my God, why people don't want me to have the job? Boy, invert. <laughs> invert. It's not possible. You, that's just this white crazy dude. Say something real quick. This is, I'm having a lot of fun over here thinking about inverting. <laughs> <laughs> I am. <laughs> but, um, you know, I like knowing where the invisible walls are. So... <laughs> I do. Mm -hmm. um, where, where does invert become like out of context? And like, wh where would you not use it? Would I, where, it's not, it's, okay, there's no such thing as a, all the time. Exactly. <laughs> Surgery might not work. <laughs> what does a healthy person look like? Like, the body is so complex that, first of all, let me say this about inverting. Inverting is always being updated. There's no, there's no destination inverting. Okay. I may invert something today and learn new data tomorrow and re-invert it again or learn more discovery or more insights and change my inversion. So I'm always updating my inverts. Yep. Right? I don't, if I'm doing business with somebody, I don't go invert once. Okay, no, 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 no. That's ego. I will invert. Listen for new information that I couldn't see before and update my invert information, which can shift my strategy. See where I'm going with that? Yep. So it's not, a, it's not an end all. You don't invert, you're done. What it does is I, I invert and then I question my inversion. Like how? So I might invert something. Like I might say, <clears throat> I, might, I might change the meaning of racism and then go, and then hear new data about something that happened and go, hmm, how does that apply? Uh, is, is my inversion correct? What is, what is it I couldn't see? Uh. Because in order for me to accurately invert, like Bayesian theory, I have to have accurate data of what's happening. But because I'm a human being with limited attention, as we know about that in the past, yeah. then my attention limits what I have access to. So as my attention grows, I update my invert. And that's different from reframe, which could be from anywhere, because invert is really the process of, of backing Which, in. by the way, some people said, how do you... What are some of the super tools on fighting defensive culture? Mm -hmm. There's three super tools, and there's a lot of tools, but there's three super tools. Reframing, mm -hmm. inverting, mm -hmm. and questions. If I'm working with a group of people and I'm, I'm trying to manage a team, don't always make statements. Tenil can tell you this, I'm known for this. Why'd you do that? You know you know the answer, don't. Because 50% of the time you're wrong. 50% of the time you're wrong. Yep. So the more you learn to turn, even when you teach somebody, try to teach new questions. What would you do then? What do you think it should be? You may have the answer. You could be the expert. doesn't matter. If you turn the world, when you use questions, you can pull yourself out of defensive space and you can pull the person that's working with you out of defensive space. Inverting will allow you to see things from both sides. And reframing allows you to, what Kaja said earlier, which is, what you, what, was your, what was your definition of inverting? That was free framing. What was your de definition of inverting? To, to turn it inside out. That's a reframe. Like you look at it from, I can look at it this way, I can look at it this way, I can look at it this way. Inverting is go to the end and come backwards. Mm -hmm. So, you, you know, for example, it's a 5% chance you'll survive, it's a 95% chance you'll die. <laughs> right? That's the same thing, but that's a reframe. Inverting is looking at something going down the road, okay, we're here now. Okay, what could have destroyed us? And what do we? What would have to be true for us to be successful? Those are both inversions. So as you like, you say, you know, how many times you hear somebody go, "I'm gonna open up a restaurant." Okay, cool. Let's invert it. First of all, how much do restaurants usually make? What would have to be true for your restaurants to make that kind of money? And once you start, you start realizing holes in your thinking in the beginning. But if you're going forward, you're caught up in the restaurant, the shape, the location, the kind of the food, the da 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 You get all these details and you're blinded by all the noise and you can't see the move and where you're going. Right? It's like, if we did, like, let's just take Court Smith. If Court Smith was to be successful and be the richest black clothing company in the world, what would have to be true 
and what would prevent him from achieving that mm -hmm. based upon all the historical assessment and stories that we have. Now, as we learn more history and information, we can update, update those stories and that information, right? Why did Court Smith focus on the basketball industry? Because usually in order to compete with the big guys, the big guys have a privilege. They have so much money that they can ward off competition and they have room for, um, what do you call it, um, they can scale up more aggressive than you can. So they can, mm -hmm. you know, Coca-Cola say if they want Coca-Cola to go to a city where there's no Coca-Cola and you go to the same city, they can make sure every store has a, that drink overnight. You can't. Yeah. You don't have that kind of money, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. But where, where the small guy often can take down the big guy is he can hit an area that the big guy can't see. So the court tells the story all the time. Adidas and Nike don't really see the young kids playing basketball. He does. That gives him a platform to build and eventually he can expand to the broader audience because he used that platform to get a certain amount of growth and momentum and by the time the large companies know he's there, it's already too late, right? And now he can start, they, they can start to invade their territory by going, oh, so y'all got you know, local uh, malls? I got local malls now. Y'all have online presence? I got social media online presence. He can start doing it because now he has the resources to move more aggressive. But in his early stages, he just quietly finds a market that is strong enough for his growth and he exploits those opportunities and that's how you take down big guys. Big guys, even if big guys see it, they're so heavily invested over here to turn that ship is so fucking slow. By the time they turn the ship, you should have already consumed 80% of that market. So that's Court Smith brilliance. So then if Court was working on a business strategy every year, he would say, what about Court Smith would have to change for us to get to the next level? If we want to get to the next level, what would have to be true? And what would destroy our ability to get to the next level? And as you come with the list, you start seeing all the gaps and holes and opportunities as you look at the list. That's strategic, that's strategic as fuck. Pass the microphone. You guys get, I mean, you guys see, I'm, I'm giving you a hardcore strategy today because y'all asked for some strategy. I said, okay, let's do some strategy. I like strategy shit. That's what I like to do. So this whole time you've been talking, I've been thinking about reverse engineering. Mm -hmm. Is that kind of the same concept or what's different from there, There's a degree of that. There's a degree, because reverse engineering is, it is a form of inversion. Yeah, it is a form of inversion. It's just sometimes you don't have to be as, um, you can, but the use a tool every day, you won't be that detailed. Because reverse engineering kind of implies more of an aggressive inversion plan, which I, I like it. I like it. I'm, I, I'm totally with it. But what I'm trying to get everybody in the class to do is use it daily and just the way you think. Mm -hmm. So when my wife tells me something new, I always invert. Now I got to be aware. My, when I invert, sometimes I got to make sure my biases are not corrupting my, my process. And then I'm able to come back and she's just like, man, you're really insightful on in these things and you have these, we have seen the world, I'm just inverting. That's all I'm doing. I'm not special. You could do it too if you learn how to invert. And, and one more thing. Um, you talked about our decision-making process and how there's ample options of what we can decide based on how we see the world or how we may... Um, our perspective of it, right? So if we invert based on that um, perspective that we have, we may come up with different end outcomes that also give us different answers. So is there maybe a right or wrong way or, or a, a better process of inverting or inversion than to just maybe depend on our biases or you know just looking so, at so, it from our own perspective? So invert, when you invert, it's, it's an observation game. Right, mm -hmm. so a lot of times you never got into this space. So it's, you're, that's why that's the process is a protection against your biases. Uh. And so when you go through the process, that's why when I'm out and about, I'm listening to stories and I ask, like for example, you say, "Oh, Apple is doing this. I want to know why. Mm -hmm. I really want to know why, because then that gives me something to use to invert. Where if I'm just listening to things, I'm kind of pop culture, listening to everything. I don't have nothing to invert with. Mm. So I have to learn more about." Worldly wisdom, how things work in this world, how things move behind the scenes, where incentives, all kind of different principles are working behind the scenes as influencing human behavior. And then when I invert, I'm able to look at more layers. So for example, let's say if I don't understand incentives and I invert and I leave incentives outside, outside of my inversion process, what's going to happen is that my, as I invert, it's going to be flawed. 
But you'll know it's flawed if you keep practicing it because you start to see you you start getting alignment as you as your wisdom grows. But if you're this really superficial knowledge or you're plugged into like, so one of the worst things you can ever do as a human being is over leverage ideology. If you're like, I believe in this, and you echo that, the more you scream an ideology, the weaker your thinking becomes. The more you learn to just be observant and learn, learn to think beyond your beliefs. Then when you run across things that are foreign, you develop the tools to invert with it. It's when you get to the point where I'm a hardcore Muslim. I don't care what you say. I'm a hardcore Muslim. Nothing else matters. I'm a hardcore Muslim. Well, you're only saying it to, to trash your brain. Now you're at a point where everything that happens in front of you, you make it a Muslim issue. It's not. You can't invert because you try to make everything fit the, the Muslim story. What you want to get to a point where if a white trans dwarf is standing in front of you, <laughs> they're really tall. They think they, they think they're short. Um, if, if they're a right trans dwarf, you can see that person for who they are and not have to run into some falsified process. You see them for who they are. Do not write down white trans dwarf. <laughs> <laughs> he's, he, that's going to be weaponized against me in the future jokes. So, <laughs> so, so, so being able to see human beings are so diverse, especially as our population grows, and there's hella opportunities out here, you got to learn to see what it is, not what you want it to be. So inversion is, if you have a healthy learning process and you invert, the more you learn, the more, the better, the higher it's all based upon probability, but you improve your, your accuracy. It's not perfection, but it's a super tool. Invert. I promise you, if you want to stay in crime, invert it. It'll make hella sense. You don't invert it, you get, you get snagged on how you feel, what happened to you personally, what you saw, YouTube videos, popular politics. Invert it, and it makes all the sense in the world. Invert. It sounds super playful, like just yes. go into your imagination, yes. go into your vision. That's what perfect if, word. What if, what if? That's the best choice. That, that's yeah. the best way to conclude. Yeah. That's exactly what it is. It's yeah. playful. He, you couldn't have said it any better. It's playful. And that gives you, that allows you to, inf it informs your hypothesis. Because remember, everything you do is a hypothesis. But it informs your hypothesis and it enriches your hypothesis to make better in my hypothesis. If you meet somebody in verse all the time, they are, you could be in a room where everybody's like really kind of moving in this direction in their conversation, going, yeah, yeah, and they just they just they just expanding their opinion around this what this problem. And the person who inverts will say something way over here. Later on, you'll be like, how the fuck you know that? Because they inverted it. And everybody got caught in the momentum of whatever's happening. Like if you if you invert crime, like if you're a gangster, you invert your lifestyle, you you're done. I'm out. This doesn't make any sense. I got to the end. Trash. My father inverted. My father was a dope dealer. And my father inverted it for me as a kid. He's like, yo, he took me to go see Scarface. This is how far back. We did the movie theaters. I'm like, that shit was crazy. He goes, all right, so let me tell you something about my lifestyle. I don't live outdoors no more. I live behind closed doors. I got six people. I don't talk to six people, period. I've never been to jail, but I got a gun in every room. I live the threat of my life being taken every day. And even when I leave the house, I have a plan on how to come see you. He inverted the whole thing. But if you still want to learn this, let me know. I was out. <laughs> I was so out of there. I'm not going outside no more. Bro, you don't. Shh. Hey, what are them bankers at? I need to talk to new dudes. <laughs> I'm out. <laughs> I got. But most people don't, when they think about being a gangster, they don't invert. They go into like, they moving into all the incentives and they just getting blinded by the incentives. But if you invert, the incentives become muted. You see what just happened? I muted all the incentives. Next slide. Next slide. All right, y'all, I'm going to run through this one. This is going to be the last 45 minutes. But next slide. Before we get there, I just want to say those at home, those who are watching for the first time, make sure you donate to this because this whole class is an investment in our community. And in order for us to invest in you, please invest in us. Um, I'm not really good at asking for donations because I'm a for-profit business owner. <laughs> but when you run a nonprofit, you got to put that out there. It's the most awkward space. I think I'm going to record a video so we can have somebody do this for me because as you can see at home, I'm trash at this and I don't, I'm not going to use my press secretary to convince me that I'm doing a good job. This is trash. So just donate if you can. 
um guilty 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 i hope you feel guilty okay um make sure you subscribe um if you're on youtube if you watch this on facebook make sure you go to youtube and subscribe so you can uh, receive our classes for free also for paid members i want to say this real quick for all paid members um in the paid group um if you have questions between the classes you go home and have questions Put them in a, in a Facebook group, and what me and Corey's going to start doing in our classes is answer your questions in the next class that you have from the previous class. So if you have any questions, just add those questions to the group. Um, me and the team is going to work on it, as, as you guys know, um, the marvelous Danielle. Danielle's like the, the, um, the um, um, what's it, Michelle Obama slash Donna Ross slash Beyonce of, of Fight Team Media. And, um, and as you guys know, Okay, stop. <laughs> Tenille, <laughs> Tenille, hold on, Tenille, hold on, hold on, hold on. <laughs> oh, oh, <man. laughs> left the house, people. People at home, Tenille has left the house. <laughs> she said, you ain't, about to, you ain't about to talk about no other woman in front of me. <laughs> oh, God. Oh, I love her to death. You see what happens Woo. when you go away for a week? Hey, look, look, Tenille, Tenille, baby. Um, <laughs> but um, she's going <laughs> to Alright let's just move on Just put your questions in the group Okay I can't I can't Alright this next one This is about to get fired y'all I'm about to, I'm going to on one subject Shabish you ready Next slide Next slide Alright go back Go back Go back Read that bottle for me Locus of control Refers to An individual's perception About the underlying Main causes of events In his or her life or more simply, do you believe that your destiny is controlled by yourself or by external forces such as fate, God, or powerful others? Okay, y'all black, right? And I don't know if Latinos go through this. Latino folks chime in online because I don't want to speak for y'all. Black people, this hunts us as a culture. This is how we talk, right? Am I lying? We believe that Something's controlling our life. White people won't let me. White people created racism, which prevents us. Systemic racism is real, y'all, but that's why we haven't, right? In my process of having a conversation, I inverted Black Wall Street. And I looked at Black Wall Street and I stepped back as a macro and said, why well, is that story okay? Why do we keep telling that story that way? If I was a general, and you told me about the defeat of a previous army, what would I do? I will study it so I won't make the same mistakes. But I would not call it a destiny. But for many of us, we, def we talk about it as it's, it's our destiny. If we do anything, this is what white people are going to do. They're going to they're gonna empower themselves, organize themselves, and prevent our evolution. We even go on so far to say that um, it doesn't happen. You know, I prayed about it. Yeah, but what did you do about it? Or... You know, I come from the hood. This is just how my life is. I've never been good at writing. I've never been good at reading. I've never been good at this. Um, we speak in this fate, godly, super powerful people have control over us, right? And so then, watch this. We also the same people will turn around. Remember when Dope Dylan first started? They asked the young brother, why are you selling dope? I got to feed my family. No ownership. Something else happened. They won't let me, so I got to do what I got to do. All you hear somebody go, <clears throat> you know, I smoke weed because it makes me, it helps me. What are you giving up when you say you smoke weed? Control. There's multiple ways you can give up control. But a lot, of often, a lot of times we just think of control as I want to do this. If you prevent me, you know, I wanted to leave the house. Don't lock me in the door. We don't realize that subconsciously we move in a space where we're constantly giving up our locus of control. Read that definition one more time for me, Scott. I don't have my glasses. <laughs> oh, shit. You didn't put up Locus my of person. control <laughs> refers to the individual's perception about the underlying main causes of events in his slash her life. Thank you, sir, for bending over for a second. Pause. 
or more <laughs> or more simply do you believe that your destiny is controlled by yourself or by external forces such as fate god or powerful others so we all agree that's 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 a um a epidemic in our communities so you might disagree before i move forward i mean we hear it all the time it's probably baked into conversation okay josh this is not this is not an opportunity to celebrate jewish culture um so do we all we all agree right okay next slide next slide go ahead Locus of control can wait, have wait, significant. Wait, 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 losing. Hmm? Lose. I'm excuse me. Losing locus of control can have significant consequences for individuals. Here are some key points on what happens when humans lose an internal focus of control. Next slide. So this is what happens to you as an individual when you lose your locus of control. Go ahead. Loss of personal agency. Mm -hmm. With an external locus of control, people feel that life events are outside their control and determined by external forces like luck, fate, or powerful others. So for, for, just watch this. Have you guys noticed when black people get money, we apply the locus of control principles to them? Because we have a sense of loss. So because you have a sense of locus, loss of locus of control, you say the only reason Jay-Z is rich because he must be Illuminati, right? Or you'll say some shit like... Um, um, they must have got lucky or um, you know uh, Cat Williams they must be having homosexual sex to be successful right this is all the stuff that was implied and the reason so many people Cat Williams had one of the hottest interviews on the internet in 2024 because people were able to relate to that idea because they had lost their sense of local so it's a widespread problem it's not a, it's not a small problem now, this is horrible for entrepreneurs but I, I want you guys, to, the, the norm of culture is this natural loss of your locus of control. Keep going. This, dimin this diminishes sense, um, excuse me, this diminished sense of personal agency can lead to feelings of helplessness and a lack of motivation. So, 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 let's keep it real. Have you all been in the black community, right? Can we say, can we just be honest, the motivation is, is lower than it should be? I have comparison because I'm old enough to see the comparison. I go back to pre-60s, early 70s. We got to. That's how we spoke. We got to. We got to. And now the language is how do we bake into this space of this, this new brand of negative, don't give a fuck, rebellions. Like our self-cultural motivation has deteriorated drastically, right? And it's, it's so slow you know, think about the human brain. If something moves slow enough, our senses won't pick it up. And we slowly, but over a long period of time, and you see it even in our black community, where people stop looking for work after a while. They stop trying to make money. People stop trying to educate their own kids. Because why? I kind of give it the idea that I have control over this. One of my biggest arguments in the pro-black community, and I used, this was one of my first arguments, is that as we told black people, the superpowers of white supremacy, we were destroying their locus of control. We told them, you don't control your destiny, somebody else does. In this class, when we teach radical responsibility, that's the space that we're making people uncomfortable in. Radical responsibility, but what about, what about, what about? Because we're so used to giving up our locus of control. It is, I'm, I'm gonna, we're gonna go so far. So locus control, it's a cold fucking animal and it's opposite of radical responsibility and optionality. Radical responsibility and option. This is why black folks are not going to be, you try to be strategical, right? And you want to be able to see multiple plays. If you, lose a local, if you lose your locus of control, you will always see one or two plays when there might be hundreds of plays. So if it's baked into you, it's corrupting the outcome without you even knowing you're being corrupted, even though you're a good, intelligent person. Because your locus of control, you brought it to the idea that you don't have a locus of control. So read that, read that last paragraph one time. This diminished sense of personal agency can lead to feelings of helplessness and a lack of motivation to take action to improve one's circumstances. Next slide. 
Next one. Go ahead. Increased stress and negative outcomes. So I want y'all to watch this. I want y'all to see this. I mean, you can almost see large groups of people when you read this stuff. But I'm going to bring it all the way down to the individual. We keep going. Research shows that those with a more external locus of control report higher levels of stress, anxiety, and depression. That means if you think, so we're watching the suicide rate go up, right? And while we're still watching social justice energy, you see the connection now? Real quick, I want y'all to make sure you get this. When I tell you I fucking hate social justice, it's taking away the individual's locus of control. And then you wonder why suicide is higher than murders in America. I want you to pay f- mental health breakdowns are happening all over. Depression, anxiety is a thing in schools right now. The, 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 the mental health uh, professionals in school are overwhelmed by kids who are suffering from these areas. There's more medication going to your kids behind these areas, and you don't realize the language we keep shaping around our black children, Latino children, even some of these white kids and everybody else, is you don't have a locus of control. Mamas who, who does everything for your child and interrupts the process of them building a locus of control, you destroyed it in your love kindliness. See, raising humans is not about, this is what's crazy about human beings today. Being nice is a strategy. That shit's crazy. Strategy is not one anything. There's no such thing as, I do this one thing all the time, and it's always going to work. The famous saying, to a man who has a hammer, everything looks like, looks like a nail. Mm-hmm. Motherfucker, that's a saw. Well, I just broke the shit with my hand. God damn it, we ain't building nothing around here. <laughs> Locus of control is such a cold thing that if we don't protect that in yourself as well as the people in your life, you're literally participating and causing damage to them as human beings. Next one. They are also more vulnerable to negative influences and less resilient in the face of challenges. Black people, are we, have we been really, how look at us, how are we performing in the face of challenges? George Floyd died, what do we do? What do we do? What do we actually change? Like, where, where, where can we go and point to the changes you can identify? Now, we could have, but the whole conversation around George Floyd is we don't have local control of police officers. Hell if we don't. Hell if we don't. You don't have an immediate impulse of change, but can you play in a change? You change anything. If one group does this, the other group has to do that. That's called life. But when you don't think you have a locus of control, you can't even approach that idea. It says negative influences. Have you guys been on YouTube lately? Have you guys seen the language on social media lately? Oh, they person, that person, this person, this. It's just negative influence all day long. And then, especially in activist groups, it's all negative they heard us and when you say what's the solution it's like you, you'll see somebody type the word the and that's all you'll get <laughs> this is real talk this is why when you, I want to run my own business and you realize I know I want to run my own business but why can't I see anything or think about anything it's because you move in a space where you don't have locus of control remember when I told you guys like I, I purposely broke all of my addictions all of my addictions now, that doesn't mean I don't like some of them I broke them meaning they, they don't control me I had to gain control of my addiction. He's like, well, what can what I do with business? Because the empowerment of gaining control of myself gave me empowerment to move to this world and control other things. But as long as I had this idea where things are always controlling me, I will say I want to control something until something decides I want to control me. But they're not really controlling me. It's my perception I'm being controlled, which means I surrender to things I shouldn't be surrendering to. Mm-hmm. I'm a victim of my choices of surrendering, not because there's outside forces stopping me. I mean, have you been in the, in the hood and your auntie walks over to you like, you know, white people, they, they, they don't like it and it, her voice goes back up and you're like, we are in the middle of the motherfucker. Who is she whispering for? <laughs> I've been on Thanksgiving dinner. Everybody in the house black. You know, white people, they don't. Auntie, ain't nobody here. What the fuck wrong with you? Or somebody like, yeah, we can't make no money out here because white people, we're in East Oakland. White people don't even know you exist. IRS don't even come down here. What's wrong with you? <laughs> How the fuck you can't make no money in the hood? And everybody got on brand new Nikes. How the fuck is this making sense to you? The brother from the Middle East said, uh, y'all tripping. <laughs> I just want y'all, like, there was a store in New York. 
in fashion in um in a fashion neighborhood there's uh Prince Street and Canal Street, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it is it's a fashion district. Mm -hmm. And the average amount of money that I think a, a store was making was netting was a million a year, right? This Middle Eastern dude came and he opened up a store to appeal to the lower class black community. Not Middle Eastern, I think it was from okay, maybe a Russian dude. The appeal to the lower class, I, I have to get the data. And his store, they would say that's stupid, you're not gonna make money, black people don't buy shit like that. His store netted three million a year. The same people you don't have no value for, they got money, baby. They're untapped trillion dollar market. You can't even see it because in your conversation of not having locus of control, you are actually mentally putting, you reposition yourself not to be in the conversation. So, um, third one. S studies link an external locus to poor physical health. Wait, wait, did you say low, poor physical health? Mm -hmm. Kev, how many black people you see at the gym? How, what's the percentage of black people in the gym when we go to the gym? <laughs> About 4%? Give it 10, maximum 10? When Oakland was 55%, what was the percentage of black people in the, in the gym around that time? Huh? No, about 10. <laughs> <laughs> when I go to most gyms, it's not dominated by black folks, even when it's close to black folks. I see more Latinos in black community gyms than black folks, right? We dying from what? Health. When you talk about working out for black folks, it's almost like you call everybody out their name. I feel like a white man using the N-word. It don't make no sense to us. Physical health, go ahead. Lower achievement at work or school mm -hmm. and a greater likelihood of developing unhealthy habits like overeating. I told you, I went to a white community who was prospering, and guess what happened? Their neighbor, everybody's thin. I go to a black community that's suffering, everybody's overweight. When you don't think you have control, you won't take control. You learn to live in a world where you're more passive aggressive. Next slide. Reduced self-efficacy. Mm -hmm. Self-efficacy refers to one's belief in their ability to succeed at specific tasks. It is closely tied to the locus of control. Okay, real quick. So if you don't believe you can be a millionaire, a billionaire, you want to be one, but you don't really believe it. What's the chance of you becoming that? You will almost sometimes self-sabotage yourself as you start to grow too fast, unconscious to yourself because you don't believe you should be here. You're like, I'm going to take myself down before the man takes me down or somebody else takes me down because I really shouldn't be here because I didn't go to college. I'm not that dude. I wasn't this. I wasn't that. I never made this kind of money before. You see what's happening here? This is all within your look. This is shit that's happening in your deep, deep uh, governing beliefs of how you're moving through this world is when you don't feel you have a local control, you're always sabotaging or under-believing or under-engaging or under-achieving because you don't feel you're supposed to be there. Keep going. Losing an internal foc locus of control can undermine self-efficacy as people stop believing their efforts will lead to desired outcomes. So you understand like when, when white women are in black schools teaching social justice, they don't realize they're doing this to our kids. They're literally creating the friction they're trying to stop. By the way, you know what? We were supposed to celebrate everybody's birthday. I brought some cakes here for the April birthdays. So for all the April people and the rest of us, make sure y'all get some cake, because I brought that cake to celebrate uh, Josiah, Shabisha, Kev. Um, uh, the, we, well, this, this, we only got one goddess that was born this month. That's Tanil. Uh, you see what I'm saying? You see how I came back for I came for you, girl. I came for you. Pause. Um, so, 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 hey, hey, hey. So anyway, um, so let's keep going. Um, <laughs> Next one. Low self-efficacy makes it harder to persevere through difficulties and reach goals. So even when you go, so for example, remember we always say um, you got to get comfortable with being uncomfortable. Black people fall, from somebody who served black people in business, meaning that we, we, our main focus when we started business was serving um, black entrepreneurs, black small businesses, right? 
we find a lot of black folks would quit in the game because they brought in that, let me just go get a job. I don't think this is for me. It was a necessary fire you have to go through to become pure gold, and they couldn't get through the fire because in the back of their mind, they didn't think they had control. Keep going. I'm, I'm, I'm flowing through this because I'm going to get to this. I got 20 minutes. Go ahead. Reduced. Okay, okay, uh, next slide. Go ahead. Difficulty coping with setbacks. Mm. Those with an external locus are more likely to blame outside forces. Ooh, what'd you say? We didn't get, because, because you know, I was, I was distracted. I was reading this bottle water bottle, the finest water. Go ahead. <laughs> Those with an external locus are more likely to blame outside forces when things go wrong rather than reflect on what they could change. So you see how when, when that problem happened to me as a business person and I was blaming, I was like, that don't feel comfortable to me because I developed a different locus of control. But when you, when you hear these social justice type dialogue or you're sitting with, you know, as black women or as women or as, as, as dwarfs, whatever the fuck you are, as you point fingers to the outside world, the, you know, the white people, they don't like me. <laughs> Maybe you're not good. Maybe you just don't do a good job. Stop assuming because, look, white men, Asian men, black men, any other race you could come up with in the next few seconds, and whatever gender you want to come up with in the next 10 seconds, all want to win. We don't give a shit what color LeBron James is. If you're going to help me win this championship, <laughs> I'm hiring from LeBron James. Fuck all what you heard. Look here, Buck. Larry and Michael, I know we all white here, but Leroy right here gonna help us win the championship. You shut the fuck up. That's exactly how the game goes, right? But when you blame all the time, you don't see what growth you need to go through. When you think everybody's attacking you, you don't realize what you're doing to be attacked. How are you priming the situation? We blame the bully and we don't sit down with the person who's being bullied. What's going on with you? Right? And it, often the bully, is, the bully and the, and the bullied is a relationship. It's not about this bad guy takes it to the small guy. But when you need the locus of control, it's easy to fall in love with hating the bully because the bully is taking away the locus of control of the bullied. You guys get what I'm going with that? Mm -hmm. But if you saw it, if you understood that that is a distortion in everything that we see in human life, even when your enemy gives you advice or your enemy talks, you need to listen. It's not that you need to agree. You need to hear where's the truth in what this person is saying or why, what's his sentence? Like, what, why, what's the why here? What do I need to hear here? I came across this when I was younger. I was, <clears throat> I've been going to a, I'm pro-black. This is my militant age. This is when I walked around with, with a backpack full of books and daishikis and said I hated white people. I'm not lying. That's who I was. I, mean, my, I remember the young lady I was with had a son, and she went to school, and the teacher called the house and said, um, <clears throat> little man is saying that he hates white people. I said, Ann, what fuck you call me for? That's what the fuck I taught him. That's who I was. Mm -hmm. So now it's time for me. I have a job. It's time for me to go for a review. So I used to play all kind of games. White man would come in with his partner sit down with me, we'll do a review, and I put on dark sunglasses. He said, can you remove your glasses? I said, no, can you remove one of the persons from the room? Because right now, with you two against one, it's not even. So when you put on sunglasses, you, take, you can't read my eyes. That makes it even for me. I'm an asshole. Young 20-year-old, fuck the white man, right? But I'm still getting paid by him. Trip on the concept here. Wow. <laughs> so he would give me feedback. In my mind, oh, fuck this dude. Fuck you. You ain't my daddy. I don't know you. Fuck you. You ain't down. You ain't down with me. You ain't there for me. You know where the fuck I come from? I don't hear none of the shit you coming from. I was literally saying this in my head the whole time. How much you gonna pay me? You gonna take my money? All right, cool. I'm out. Thanks. You can, and I even told him, you know, in the future you can skip this review shit. You gonna fire me? Fire me? You gonna keep me? Keep me? But you can really keep this. I don't really need to be hearing your opinion. And then one day I went down the street. I'm thinking, but what if something they're saying is truthful? Are you so goddamn militant you can't hear anymore? I always had this like other voice of like reasoning talking to me. The brother, like the one angel was like pro-black with shotguns on his back. The other one just had a suit on. <laughs> like, say, man, uh, could it possibly be true? And at that day, I was like, damn, that's a hell of a dilemma to be in as, as a militant. 
is when is your enemy giving you good advice? Then they don't realize that if somebody's willing to talk to you, it's a motherfucker who don't talk to you is your real enemy. If somebody gives you feedback, it's still worth hearing. They may not be accurate in the why, but they're accurate in the experience. Mm. That's a cold thing. That's why you can't put labels on. If I'm willing to talk to you, I'm throwing out a, a I'm offering friendship. And if you instantly go, oh, you're a man, woman, da 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 it's because you don't feel like you have a locus of control. Don't blame me for that shit. Now y'all starting to see why I hate low social justice more and more? How it, it, it creates, it deepens the damage we're already suffering. It's not helping us. It's not helping us. It's not fucking, it, it over amplifies pity. All the things that keep you stuck and stop you from moving forward. Y'all see where I'm going with this shit? This shit is cold game. Okay, so external, external, okay, so this external contribution style makes it harder to learn from mistakes and regain sense of control after setbacks. I mean that when you blame and you get set back or you fall, so that one, of, one of the most guaranteed ways to guarantee that you will never be successful is if you fall not to get back up. You're guaranteed not to, you're guaranteed. And through inversion, if you fall and you can't get back up, you're guaranteed to fail. You're guaranteed. Like, just cut through the paperwork and build you a, a tent outside and just go start kicking it because you're guaranteed. This is where you're going, right? So the, the key thing in life, if you want to grow anything, you have to master the art of getting back up. But if you get back up and repeat the same fucking mistakes, at some point you're going to beat yourself down to the point you have no more motivation to get back up. So the way you get back up and not let it happen to you again is you learn from the setback. But if you engage in this low-level, gossiping-based-ass, weak-ass dialogue where you're blaming the world and what's wrong with this and the person's like, yeah, yeah, that happened to me too. That's why I don't like them motherfuckers. All they're doing is cementing your setback. Is this cold? I'm, 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 y'all, y'all hear me? Y'all stay with me, right? Mm-hmm. You cementing your setback by blaming and focusing on other people's shit because you don't have a sense of how do I... The reason you want to take a radical responsibility because you're able to ask yourself a simple question. What did I do? What level of control did I implement that caused all this shit to happen? If I say, Javon did this to me, I give up my control. Now Javon can bully me because I let him be the bully in my head. Yeah, yeah, y'all with me? Mm-hmm. Next slide. In essence, losing an internal locus of control can create a self-perpetuating cycle of helplessness. Oh, man. You know what? We need white people. Like, you know, we voted. They need to give us. They need help. What's about reparations? I don't understand. Oh my God! They gentrified. They gentrified. They just came along one day. It's like get your black ass up out of here, and we had no choice. Oh my God! You hear the language? How loss, loss of locus control. We talked like that all the time. They burnt down Wall Street, and then at that point, we was like, oh shit, there's nothing else. We're waiting for them to give them approval. Then let's build our first business in East Oakland, where they don't even show up at. Oh my God! But if we make 10 million, they're going to hear about it in Walnut Creek where they're making billions and come down and be like, call the police and say, take that Negro's $10 million. <laughs> that's, that's inverted, this dumb shit we sell. I'm like, oh my God, I'm about to get the fuck up out of here. This shit crazy. Keep going. Diminished motivation. Mm-hmm. Poor outcomes. Oh, you know what? So, cheers out. Since we, you know, we ain't gonna blow up anyway. Let's just fadingle some shit, hook some shit up. As long as I can make me some money, I ain't really tripping on this shit because these niggas don't need none anyway. Y'all see that all the time in our black business. We run them diminished. We don't run them strong. We run them weak because we don't think we're gonna grow anyway. So we just trying to get, trying to get a lick as far as cash. You guys, you're about, you, we're just trying to get a bag. We don't give a shit about whether it looks good, strong, sustainable, long term. Why are we playing long term game? I don't even be here long term. Because in a sense, I don't control my life. Stay with me, y'all. I want y'all to see how cold this shit is. And some of y'all sitting here and listening to me online right now have given you a locus, locus of control. Keep going. And difficulty overcoming adversity. Mm, what do you mean? Difficulty overcoming what? Adversity. 
I'm going through some shit right now, you know. So like, every time I turn around, shit be just it's rough on me out here. Everybody who see you feel like you always depressed. You you a walking depression billboard should be on just on his shirt or something. That shirt big. Go ahead. Maintaining an internal locus is generally associated with greater well-being and success across multiple life domains. When you gain a locus control, your life becomes way fucking better. Just listen to the way you talk about your life. Go look at your journals and see how much control you gave up. If you go through your journals, you realize if, if you change, if you start to reframe those conversations when you gave it locus control, those are all decision points you could have made to make your life a thousand percent better. But many of you guys, just listen to the way you talk to yourself. I ain't never been good at that. What the fuck are you talking about? Here you go. So, here, let's, here, so let's go. Let's go to solutions. No, no. Go read that bottom. Go back. Go read that bottom line. Here are some effective ways to develop an internal locus of control. Next slide. Okay. Here you go. Reframe your mindset. Remember that powerful thing I call reframing? I'm having a bad day. Okay. There's a saying that says, a man... And for the social justice folks who I don't give a shit about, a man or a woman who goes through life without knowing history will live a life like a child. A lot of times you can't reframe the moment because you only see the moment. The more you let her, I have been like, this is one of the hardest times I've ever been through. Have you? Do you know anything about 50 years ago? 100 years ago? Do you know about New York in the 70s? If you look at history, you realize if you can hear my voice right now, you good. You you standing on a solid platform to go to the next level. Now, if you can't hear my voice right now, I ain't talking to you anyway. But the reality is that if you can reframe shit, change the way, look at the other side of it, look at it from a different angle, you'll realize, oh, shit, I'm tripping. I'm here right now, right? I got a chance. I'll never forget this. I was laying on my couch. I was broke. Broke, broke. I think I had $20 a week to live off of. Discount grocer was my cousin. I was buying the corners getting hens and potatoes and eggs like a motherfucker, eating that shit like it was a religion two or three times a day. So at one point, I was so broke it hurt, and I crawled up in a circle, and I'm literally in a ball. And I'm laying on the couch, and I said, Dude, what the fuck you doing? You suffering to play every day, do art. If you don't get your ass up, you gotta pay something for this. And I was like, yeah, I'm tripping, let me get to work. It was over, I reframed it. I realized you mad because you're doing what you wanna do the way you wanna do it. You signed up for this shit and you have a good life outside of being broke right now. You don't get your ass up and go, go get back in this game. And if you're having a problem, it's not the outside world tripping. The customer ain't tripping. The client, you doing something wrong. Figure what that, lay on his bed ain't making you no better. What you doing? See what I mean, reframing? So I gave myself not only motivation, I gave myself a plan on what I need to start working on now and then start testing it so I can have a strategy on how to get my customer. Y'all see that? Keep going. So finish that, finish that paragraph. So challenge beliefs that external forces like luck, fate, or others control your life. So wait a minute. So you have to challenge all the beliefs that external forces like luck, I call it probability. You, you know, luck doesn't happen to a motherfucker who ain't doing nothing. Fate. I challenge all those conversations. That was your fate because you did. <laughs> You're right. <laughs> my life just started, partner. You, you ain't about to tell me what my fate is. You don't, get to, you don't get to project your limitations on me. That's my famous phrase. You do not project your limitations on me. It didn't work out for you? Hmm, not for me. <laughs> or others control your life. I ain't, you're not about to hear me champion the white man's power. The white man. You're not going to hear me talk about, you'll never hear me talk about black women because you guys are my greatest ally. You won't hear me talk about nobody as stopping me. Some of my clients are earthly, social justice, trans, dwarfs, everything. They ain't stopping my money. They love me. And those that keep paying me, I love them too. 
Nobody's stopping me. It's when you start. Can somebody stop you? Yeah. Somebody shoot you in the head right now. You stopped. But the problem is that we stop ourselves 99% of the times. That 1% never happens. So I live my life thinking about what I'm about to do next. <laughs> if I have a group of motherfuckers who hate on me, that's just a group of human beings. Human beings are not, they don't consist on shit. <laughs> I ain't never seen a group of human beings stay consistent all the time on shit. If they do, they're pretty stupid. Like Colts, they're pretty consistent, but they're stupid as fuck. Jimbo from down south who pours poorer than you are, yeah, he consistent because he's suffering. But once you understand that, there's a play. There's a move you can make. But you don't have to look as a control. You accept the action as the absolute. I don't give a shit if a white man says he doesn't like me. Okay, cool. You don't like me? Good. Okay, we got past it. All right, so you can buy this product or not. <laughs> like, 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 what do I do with it? Like, motherfuckers, the Americans say they don't like Russia. Google's what? The dude from Google's from where? Russia. Right? Motherfuckers say we don't like foreign people invading our country. Why is this Samsung still the most of Apple technology, American, co American company called Apple Technology? If we were so, we're not letting nobody in, uh, we kind of fucked up a lot. You know California 30% Latino? California, one of the richest states in the United States, 30% Latino. Build borders. You really, you really think you're going to be able to really do that? Come on. Eh. Yeah. Not really. Once you buy into limitations, that's what your life is about. You will live your life. You will live your life and see all the invisible walls that don't exist and be moving accordingly. Ooh, 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 ooh. Wait a minute. Oh, ooh, shit. Okay, wait a minute. They won't promote me because I'm black. They won't promote you because you don't know shit. You move like a servant. You don't move like a leader yet. You got to learn how leadership over management. Management and leadership is not the same thing. Go ahead. Next one. Watch your language. Avoid absolutes like I have no choice and use more empowering phrases that acknowledge your agency. So my daughter says, Dad, you know, I'm not really good at writing tools. I said, no, you have in practice. You're not good right now. If you practice tomorrow, you could be great. I don't ever hear what you can't do. When you talk about your, we talk so shitty to ourselves. Okay, the reason we often lack compassion for others is because we lack compassion for ourselves. Or the reason we're assholes to others is because we're assholes to ourselves. Most of our external facing negative attitude is how we treat ourselves. Learn to talk to yourself different and that will, sh that will change the way you show to the world. When I learned to realize to love all people, now mind you, I'm pro-black, meaning that my first investment will always be black folks first. That's the, that my fire alarms are going off. My community's in danger. I ain't got time to work on the white people shit. I got time to work on the Asian people shit. But if I'm sitting at a cafe, white people cool with me. I'm cool with them. I like white people. I like Asian people. I like Latino I like them all. But I know where my party, see, I'm different. I, I know where my office lies. But if I walked around hating Asian people, hating white people, what is that doing to me? Y'all see where I'm going with this? Also, you think black people are the only people that hold knowledge? Everybody holds knowledge. So when I'm out and about, I'm curious. I want to talk to everybody. I want to know everybody. I want to see everybody. But the reason some of y'all walk around with only talking to one person here and there is because you got walls in your head that's blocking you from even seeing the world properly. Now you want to run a business? What the fuck are you going to sell to? The wall? People that are on the other side of the wall? You don't, you, don't, you, don't, you don't like those motherfuckers. How can you see them as just being humans that you want to make money for? Being pro-black doesn't mean you have to hate others. That means you have to really invest in your own. Most of us, more, we invest more in the hating of others and we don't invest shit in loving our own. If you want to be honest about pro-black people, they're the most angriest, maddest, I don't like white people for shit. But you ask them, what if, okay, so what you building for black people? Huh? Huh? You ain't said nothing yet? Huh? No, you're never going to say nothing? Huh? No, they don't. No. Now the ones who wake up and become offensive, they become beasts. Because my loyalty lies with my community. I serve my, I take care of my own house. That doesn't mean I shit and damage other people's houses. Because I realize that my house value, it still relies upon its relationship to their house. See, in a system of a large population, other populations are impacting your resources. So you got to learn to see them to make and grow things you want to grow in society. They even subsidize systems that you use to make your community better. If you go to Palo Alto or uh, Menlo Park, Beautiful houses. A lot of our money's out there. 
because they make their money off of all people. Wake up, people. Make some money. And then invest in solutions. Create better kids, schools for your kids. Don't be mad at white people and be mad at racism and your schools are still shit. It's missing some brain power here, people. I want you to see how we're using our energy. It's almost like you find all your tanks in the desert and then when the war shows up, you ain't got no bullets. What the fuck wrong with you? Next one. Practice optimistic thinking by reframing setbacks as challenges. There you go. When shit go wrong in your life, it's a challenge for you. Not, oh, damn, thing went wrong. I'm broke right now. All right, all right. This, this, you know you've been here before, Nana. Let's do it. Let's do what we got to do. Remember, I was on the couch. And once I reframed it, I challenged myself. I didn't continue. I, and, I'm, and I won't talk to people and be like, yeah, I'm broke too. Well, what the fuck wrong with you? We can't be broke together. I don't want to talk to you. Let's come, I'm going to get hungry while I'm talking to you. Bye. I'm going to reframe everything to move forward. I ain't got time to reframe that. Yeah, it's so fucked up out here. For you, that's too bad. When you wake up, let me know how you feel. I just told you. No, you didn't. I'm out. Keep going. Practice optimistic thinking by reframing setbacks. As challenges within your control to overcome. Your challenges for you to overcome. I want to stop hearing y'all talking about my friends, my boyfriend, my cousin, my challenges for you to overcome. Stop blaming everybody for some shit that, you know, my life's messed up because my mama, my auntie, my cousin, my... For you, when you at 18, shut the fuck up. I started at 16. I started coming up with some ideas. I <laughs> my family's like, you need to go to class. I got a plan. <laughs> 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 Look, my, I took the all hard class 10th and 11th grade. Y'all think I'm about to do this for three years. It doesn't make any sense. I'm going to use this last year just to chase girls. So I got a plan. So you can get mad. They're going to call you all you want. But if you look at my credits, I'm good. <laughs> I took over control. There's some people that would just do what people tell them. And they just, they're almost, they have zero value. They're hella smart doing nothing. No value. Y'all know people like, they just do everything. If you tell them to do it, there's certain, you know there's a certain community. We know they like that. They don't be questioning shit. But, but the people who build, they question everything. Rich people define language. Poor people try to get it right. Next slide. Take responsibility. Oh, are we back to the, the do you do a full circle on this journey? Take radical responsibility. All the shit. Now, I want you to say, when we tell you take radical responsibility all this time, that's the shit we're trying to help you avoid, all the shit we just came through. All this depression and victimization and impotence and inability to stick with a, with a long-term plan and your inability to produce high quality, your inability to compete, your inability to grow, your inability to lose weight, the inability to have a happy life, inability to have a relationship. It's tied to what? Start the first phrase? Take responsibility. I'll be down. <laughs> Own your decisions and actions instead of blaming external for circumstances. Ooh, keep going. Be accountable to others and ask for feedback on areas you can improve. Now, didn't this, this, did, did we just kind of go through a full loop and come all the way back to become accountable to others? There's this thing called little old me bias. You know, I believe I, I live my life so I can be happy. I think I deserve this. And this is why your life is so fucked up and your budget's so fucked up. See, when you serve others, your money become stable. When you live a life where it's all about what I need to feel, I think Sada Guru said something like that. Like, you know, there's days the world goes exactly the way you want to, but most of the time it won't. Mm -hmm. Go to fuck up kids. See, and why you act like a kid? Because what does a kid have? Like a control. We were out in San Diego. And a group of adults, and some kids. And we got to a restaurant for breakfast around 12. So we're doing a new uh, brunch breakfast type thing. We get there and the person's like, oh, so late, so late. They're traveling with us. Traveling like, oh my God, so late. They get in the car and they're building animosity, they're getting angry. <laughs> late, hungry. <laughs> White coast of people say, hey, you should eat something. 
before we get to the spot. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I just want, I just want to protect my stomach. I want to make sure where we go and the food's good. <laughs> so I was like, okay. We drive 45 minutes to the place because um, San Diego is bigger than the Bay. It's about the same size as the Bay Area, the whole Bay Area, right? 7.5 million people in the Bay Area. San Diego is like around 7 million people. It's it's a big ass, big ass city, big as fuck. 45 minutes. Get to the restaurant. Get there on a Friday. So usually you get there someplace on Friday for brunch. You should just walk straight on in. Sorry, sir. It's an hour wait. She, so I turn around and say, hey, it's going to be an hour wait. This person goes, what? <laughs> <laughs> that person, my son, and another young person stormed off and walked back to the car angry. I just feel like nobody's considering me. This is bullshit. I'm hungry. You see loss of local control? They mad because of this loss of local control. Not because of what's happening. Because here's a, here's a solution. You could have ate before you left the house. You could have asked to stop on the way to the restaurant so you can grab your uh, uh, energy bar. We in a neighborhood where there's hella cafes. Oh, one hour? Okay, y'all. Give me a minute. I'll be right back. Go get some food. But instead, you sit in the car hungry as fuck, mad as fuck, because you gave up your locus of control and ain't got shit to do with shit. You guys are in business right now taking business hits. And you are over there embodying the stress because you can't see your plays because in the process you get up the locus of control. You had a bad business name, not because it was a bad business. Things will change and you have to push things back or, re or, or change new options, but you don't even see your optional play because you're blinded because you don't have a locus of control. This shit's so cold. Some of you guys are having relationships with people in constant arguments. It ain't got to do with them. You got choices. You just can't make them. All this shit you keep blaming, all your, I'm so sad, I go through so much, I've been this, you know, that's why I keep fucking up, because no, you're fucking up because you don't have any locus of control. Then you turn around and then engage in drinking and smoking, which is another form of, you know, I need this. I, I got to have this in my life. You just a walking loss of control, fuck. My life seems like I can never get together. You ain't never took control of your life. That life ain't yours. Excuse the language, and this has to do with women. I'm going to use it from a hood perspective for those of you at home who are super feminine activists. As I, as I say, I don't give a fuck about you. But those of you who are like that, I'm going to just show up to the space. You're a bitch. <laughs> okay? You don't have the ability to say to yourself, I need to take control of my life. You go, oh, oh, no, why me? Oh. And by the way, men sound like that too now. It ain't a woman thing. That's a man. <laughs> you go to, you go to, you go to uh, Grand Lake Fee, um, um, Flea Market. And then maybe walk like this. Oh, excuse me, excuse me, pardon me, excuse me. Motherfucker, you must be protecting her. She protecting you. She walk around like, yeah, I'll beat your ass. She beats my man. <laughs> I'm like, oh, I'm out. I'm out. This is too much. I, woo, give me a drink. <laughs> Locus of control. You guys be surprised how much you give it up. My kid's acting crazy. What's wrong with these nappy headed kids? What the fuck is wrong with you? Fuck wrong with you? You know, I keep getting these bad relationships. Why? Why? Just, just show up with control. You'd be surprised. Women, how many times have y'all told men, I'm going I'm to I'm do one of those, I'm going to go behind the shadow curtain. Put your hands over the girl, baby's ear. I don't want to hear this part. How many times have y'all seen women say, if he just told me the truth, I would have accepted it? Uh, y'all know y'all heard that shit. Fern, am I lying? <laughs> like, hold on, Pimpy, don't be, you're doing too much, player, you know, I'm out here working, you're about to work against the player, okay, all right, Fern, you know what I'm saying, um, if you control who you are, it works, it's when you don't control, you could now, but when you're in a situation where, uh, uh, you know, um, I'm sorry, it was an accident, I don't know, nobody wants to see that shit, people don't value you the same if you don't have sense of self-control. You are not a leader if you don't have a sense of control. You think you're a leader because you saw the title with your old blinded egotistical ass and put that, that little button on your shirt that says, I'm the director and manager and CEO of nothing. 
But the reason no one respects death you saying because you move like you have no locus of control. Do you take ownership, responsibility, control the shit's happening in your life and never point fingers? Y'all, y'all don't, y'all don't appreciate me. Um, then what are you doing to not be appreciated? I'm not valued. Why are you doing not to be valued? They won't hire me. Why would they hire you? This is some hard shit. But in the social justice world, no one's doing this anymore. All we're doing is the opposite, which is you don't have control and other people need to treat you better and it's their fault that you're going through this. Why are you creating, why are you depressed? Why are you want to commit suicide? Why do you have anxiety? I don't understand the connection anymore. It's called the problem is you're stealing these children's and human beings' locus of control. And many of you are online can participate in them dumbass conversation. Yeah, because men, let me tell you something I tell you about men. Men often don't do this and this is why I don't like men. And... Have, I, have you looked at your life lately? Huh, how's your life looking? Don't ask me about my life, but men ain't shit. No, men is, every, every human being is great. It's you don't have a sense of control, so now you blaming, and you just as weak as the rest of the people in the room. So now you see why I say social justice people are hella weak? Keep going. Learn from failures. Learn or? from failures by not making excuses Ooh. and reflecting on what you could have done differently. When you gossip, remember the course said last week, stop gossiping? That's what you're doing. You know what else he did? And then, then he did this. And then he did this. And then she did this. Yeah, man. See, that's what I, what I was telling you. What did I tell you? I mean, Tanil, she be doing the shit, right? That's, that's what I'm telling you, Tanil. I mean, Shabisha. Because huh. it wasn't for her. I'll be here. And she came in, and then I tried to talk to her. Then she was talking to me crazy. So then you know what I had to do. I just went in and cast her. What's missing there? Look at some control. If she's doing all those things, what are you doing to position yourself to receive that experience from her? Have you ever seen a woman treat one man like trash and be a kitten with another man? And each man would, and the man who got treated like trash would blame her when it was the man who didn't have the backbone to receive what he deserved. Let me keep it real. A lot of you guys are going through things because you just giving up control in your mind. You don't say, how do I take responsibility? What do I got to do to cause this? If I'm here, what did I do to get here? That's where your power comes from. Man, excuse me, black women, I don't own your power. And the shit I can say, if I can say anything on this microphone that can offend your power, you were already gone. Black men, black if you online talking about black women, you a dumbass. They, black women have never controlled your, your outcome. If anybody, if white men is stopping you, you were stopping yourself. You was meant to, you was meant to be stopped. You're a Volkswagen bug going up against the fucking storm. You don't have no fucking horsepower to get through this shit. You weak as shit. Don't blame white men for being weak. Don't blame black women. And black women don't blame black men. Stop blaming any. Don't blame gay people. I remember somebody told me, we're here because of gay. What the fuck gay people do to you? <laughs> Are you serious? With your no locus of control? Stop blaming. Stop blaming. Stop blaming all people. Stop blaming. It's making you weak. You're not learning anything. You have no, you're not, you're not developing pure organic incentive to learn the next thing because you blame and you throw away the desire to grow because you have no reason to stimulate your curiosity. Curiosity is a basic human desire. And it's not being stimulated because you're too busy blaming and you got it so insulated and thinking, well, we got everything under control. I'm not curious. I don't need to read no books. I don't know what I'm doing. I just repeat this dumbass habit I've been doing all my life. And at some point, stop being dumb. That's inverted. Next one. Build self-efficacy. Mm -hmm. Set achievable goals and follow through to build confidence in your ability. When I tell you to go to the goddamn gym, I'm trying to help you build efficacy. When I tell you to stick with something and see a win, that's efficacy building, which then gives you a different type of you to go out in the world and start changing things in this world because you start believing in you. But if you don't go to gym, you at home watching fucking TV and you call this Wednesday being uncomfortable. And then you wonder why you've been in hope for four years and you still asking for hope. You won't do the fucking basics of working on efficacy, which is build some simple wins in your life. We all can fall. But how do you get back? How do you get back up? You find some simple wins and you build on top of those wins. 
This shit is important. Keep going. Engage in planned risk taking, like trying new activities to expand your comfort zone. Nana jumped on a plane last year. That shit was some shit. <laughs> that was some shit. I'm scared of heights. I was like, yo, bro, you about to jump out this plane. And this cold thing, I get to 4,000 feet. He's like, yo, you about ready? I said, yeah. He goes, well, we got four more thousand feet to go. I said, come on, partner. I, I ain't that type of, I'm not made like that. The first three seconds was the scariest thing I've ever experienced in my human life. And then after we leveled off, my brain was stuck between like, this is great, but I'm scared. This is great. What the fuck am I doing? This is great. What if you die? You don't make it. This is great. But you know what? Was this really necessary? But this is great. If you get to the bottom, this is a shit. But God damn it, let's get to the bottom quick. Like, my brain was having a do. I had this guy with the suit was arguing with the dashiki guy. The dashiki guy was scared. The dude with the suit was like, yo, this is a great experience. My point is that push yourself to, look, fuck jumping out of a plane. Go meet new people. Talk to strangers. Try new shit. I promise you that shit's empowering. Keep going. Celebrate small wins as proof that your efforts lead to positive outcomes. So when you get small wins, celebrate that shit. Pay attention, like, damn, I actually did that. Keep going. We'll try to get through this real fast. We're almost done. Next slide. Increase self-awareness. Go ahead. This is it. Define your core values and beliefs to guide decisions aligned with your identity. Define your core values and beliefs to guide decisions align with your identity. I'm going to just, just, you got to be self-aware, self-mastery. A lot of this shit changes when you develop self-mastery. Keep going. Practice self-reflection through journaling, meditation, or talking to others. When I talk to others, I hear more about myself than I even knew existed. Go ahead. Seek out inspiring stories of people overcoming adversity through self-determination. Find people who achieve shit you thought could not be achieved. One of my favorite stories is Banana Republic. They told that cat he was a he was a, a middle he was a South American worker who came to America who built one of the largest fruit empires and he was a foreigner and he started in, in the East Coast. And he was so big that when America went to get the war against Spain, they asked him to borrow his navy ships. And he built his business in the United States. During the height of racism. Mm-hmm. When, it, when white people didn't like nobody, if he wasn't, Anglo-Saxon Protestant, he wasn't fucking with you. And he built one of the largest companies in the world. So Samsung, that's another inspiring, inspiring story. There's a whole bunch of inspiring stories you can tap into that if you look at those stories, it'll show you how you're your own limitation. Next slide. Develop problem-solving skills. Mm -hmm. When faced with challenges, brainstorm potential solutions you have influence over. Mm-hmm. Make a plan and take action instead of feeling helpless or waiting for change. Always take action. If you're sitting there oh, waiting on change, you're in a bad space. That's, what, that's the position I felt myself in. I got to get out of this. This ain't me, right? Um, the brainstorming, that's the inverting, some of the reframing, um, building peers you can have conversations with. Last one. Build resilience by learning to adapt your approach when your initial efforts fail. So if, when shit fails, don't keep repeating the same dumb strategies. Learn to change your approach. If you can change your approach, a lot of times we continue to repeat something because we're trying to make it work because we don't feel we, we feel some outside force. We feel like we're fighting an outside force. We just kind of, we don't want to beat it down as opposed to change the way you think and realize maybe my strategy is just not good enough. Next one. Keep going. Next slide. Fly through this. Go ahead. The key is adopting the mindset that you are the primary force shaping your life circumstances through the changes, through the choices you make. With practice, you can practice. you can strengthen your internal locus of control. And that's it. Any questions before we go home? Okay, <laughs> folks. <laughs> On this side of the fence of building and creating stuff, you gotta take control, you gotta take ownership. All this pointing fingers and having conversations about other people is destroying you. Learn to sit in the space and everything that's happened to your life, take ownership, everything, take ownership. Doesn't mean it's your fault. Don't mean it's right or wrong, just take ownership and watch all of a sudden you become a strategist like a motherfucker. Some of you guys are not strategists because you spend most of your time blaming the outside world. That's it. Me and you guys can't run a business or can't get anywhere because you're too busy focusing on what other people are doing to you, not what you're doing. 
all failures you had in the past, you can go back and audit your old failures and say, what did I do wrong? And if you can't see it, did, as you read and learn, look for opportunities, discover what you did wrong. You'll find it. I find it all the time. I look for, I, one of the things I used to say two years ago, I used to say in class, I love, I love discovering I'm wrong every day. But guess what I'm doing? As I discover I'm wrong, that's me operating my locus of control, what I did. Yes, others matter. But at the end of the day, it's about what did you do? What did you do? That's our superpower. And right now, as you know, as our community, we're heavily infected. We have a virus of blaming, outside control, focus. All of our conversation moves like that. And now we're trying to see it horrible. You know when a man drives fast on the freeway, that's a, that's a form of suicide? When people drive crazy on the street. When cats are acting crazy in the streets, you know that's a form of suicide. That's passive suicide. Mm. But you told them they have no control. So they don't give a fuck. They don't give a fuck about the city of Oakland. They don't give a fuck about the streets. They don't have no control. That's what you keep telling them. The race, the white man, racism, slavery, Jim Crow, you didn't have no control, he brought you here, he, police gonna do this, the government don't give a fuck about you, the President Obama didn't do nothing for you. Uh, and then one day you wake up and be like, I guess I don't have no control, give a fuck, who gives a fuck what I do? I don't even need to take care of my kids, who gives a fuck? I don't need, I'm a man, I'm out here just living these streets, I'm just gonna have sex and have fun and run up and escape my responsibilities. Cause guess what, I don't, I don't control it anyway. You see what's happening in our subconscious mind? As they say in New York, I, right, 